Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our third day of the Mid Atlantic Council's August um, 2022 meeting. We are convened today just as a council. The last two days we have spent time with our partners at ASMFC, but today we're sitting here um, just as the council. And we have quite an agenda before us over the course of the next few hours. Uh, today is a bit of rapid fire. We've We've got a lot of presentations and, and a lot of things to discuss. Um, we're going to start with our first item on today's agenda, which is BOEM guidance for mitigating impacts of offshore wind energy projects on commercial and recreational fisheries. Uh, we are going to receive presentations from um, Lorena Edenfield with the, she's an environmental protection specialist with BOEM. She'll be participating virtually as well as Julia Beatty. Um, also participating virtually with us and what the outcomes that we should expect here uh, would be to receive the presentation, have opportunity for questions and comments, and then staff are asking that we review the guidance and discuss council comments if that's the intent of the council to make comments regarding this. So uh, I will go ahead and ask if, uh, Lorena, are you ready to present or is Julia gonna start? I I didn't have that in my notes. I am ready to present. Um, uh, can you can you hold one second? Um, sure. Sarah Bland asked to make a quick announcement before we start. Go ahead, Sarah. No problem. Thank you. Sorry. Um hot off the presses. Um, I just wanted to let everybody know that this morning the proposed rule at 845. The proposed rule for Amendment 22 to the Summer Flounder Scuff and Black Sea Bass Plan published. Can't hear me. Um, amendment 22 proposed rule published this morning or filed this morning. Um, the amendment obviously considers changes to the commercial and recreational allocations. The comment period for the proposed rule um, will be open until September 12th. The comment period for the notice of availability closes on October 11th. And the decision date is November 10th. And I will email this information over to Chris and Mike this morning. Um, but I wanted to take the opportunity to let everybody know first thing this morning. Thank you, Mike. Okay, thanks, Sarah. And as a reminder, um, because of the audio challenges that we've been having in here, if you can speak as closely to your mic as possible when when speaking, I think that would help uh, for the folks in the back of the room. Um, to hear us a little bit better. So with that said, thank you, Sarah, for the update. And I'm gonna turn things over to Lorena and Julia uh, for the presentation. So whenever you guys are ready. Thank you. Good morning and thank you for having me today. My name is Lorena Edenfield. I'm an environmental protection specialist with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management. We are working in partnership on this draft guidance for mitigating impacts to commercial and recreational fisheries from offshore wind energy development uh, in partnership with the National Marine Fisheries Service and at the request of East Coast states. BOEM works closely with NIMFS, other federal agencies, tribes, states, ocean users, and other stakeholders in the renewable energy leasing and in the project review process. In late 2021, BOEM issued a request for information and hosted seven workshops which some of you may have attended, to review existing information and guidance document objectives and to receive comments on key issues that BOEM should include in the draft guidance. We received 95 oral comments and 95 written comments that helped us draft the guidance we are presenting today. We are working hard to ensure that our processes are consistent, provide greater transparency, and offer predictability and certainty. The commercial fishing industry is a crucial part of many coastal communities. It contributes to U.S. food security, jobs, and economic opportunity. And we know that for many, it's a way of life. We're working to achieve the Biden-Harris administration's ambitious renewable energy goals in a way that ensures that commercial and recreational fishers and the fisheries they rely upon can not only coexist, but also thrive. We also want to minimize impacts to the ocean environment and marine species. Our goal is that this draft guidance will provide detailed processes and methodologies to the offshore wind industry and lessees to mitigate impacts to those who fish and the fisheries. The guidance is necessary to help ensure consistent use of data and methodologies across projects and states. 
And this guidance will inform the development of project specific construction and operations plans that lessees will submit to BOEM for permitting reviews. The guidance will also be available for states as they consider their authorities through coastal zone management, procurement processes, or other opportunities for incorporation. Overall, we believe that this guidance will result in a more fair, equitable, and predictable outcome for commercial fishing industries and communities impacted by offshore wind energy development. And as with all BOEM guidance to lessees, the measures identified in the fisheries mitigation guidance may be modified in the future based on public feedback, statutory changes, and rulemaking. So what are our next steps? Our goal is to have a clear process around fisheries mitigation in place in the late summer, early fall, to support BOEM's environmental analysis for upcoming construction and operation of several East Coast projects. This mitigation will also be useful in the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific Seaboard when the time comes. But to ensure that we have smart guidance that achieves our goals, we want to have open and honest conversations. We want to find solutions to potential challenges as we move forward with offshore wind energy development. So the information that you and other ocean users, tribes, and other partners provide will help shape the future mitigation discussions and develop a long lasting engagement strategy that prioritizes science and meaningful collaboration. Next slide, please. BOEM has chosen to issue guidance for construction and operations plans as it is currently beginning the environmental review for several projects. Guidance provides a structure, flexibility, and appropriate timing as several projects begin environmental review in 2022. So why have fisheries mitigation guidance? BOEM considers the impacts to the commercial and recreational fishing industries resulting from the approval of site assessment plans and constructions and operation plans, sometimes called COPs. BOEM conducts national environmental policy reviews for NEPA, which identify potential impacts that offshore renewable energy projects may have on the environment and ocean users, such as commercial and recreational fisheries. BOEM must consider these impacts per project, and that analysis may support the need for mitigation measures. BOEM has not provided detailed guidance to the offshore wind industry regarding processes and methodologies for reducing impacts to fisheries. And this has resulted in inconsistencies between projects in mitigating impacts. It is hoped that federal guidance will provide greater consistency for equitable treatment of fishermen, regardless of home or landing port. And nine Eastern states identified to BOEM the need for and benefits of regional natural resource impact assessment and mitigation frameworks. Next slide. What potential impacts has BOEM identified? So potential fishery impacts from offshore wind could include, but are not limited to, displacement from fishing grounds during offshore wind development activities or loss of fishing areas occupied by project components, potential gear damage or loss from increased survey activity or new or additional underwater hazards, necessary gear or fishing modifications for fishing near turbines, increased transit times, or increased gear conflict or operational competition within and outside of wind project areas if the fishing effort is shifted due to the presence of the offshore wind energy projects. And there can also be secondary economic impacts for support businesses, such as seafood dealers, vendors to the fishing industry, like bait and tackle, ice, gear supply. And this also can include impacts to processors and distributors. Next slide, please. So what is mitigation? BOEM considers mitigation to encompass the full suite of activities that avoid, minimize, and compensate for adverse impacts. And we are taking a national level approach to mitigation for its offshore renewable energy program. And this concept is reflected in the Council of Environmental Quality's definition of mitigation. Next slide, please. So we'll jump into the guidance. Uh, and first, let's talk about this timeline for developing our guidance. Uh, as I said, in the fall and winter of 2021, we identified area ideas and considerations based on feedback from the fishing community, offshore wind energy developers, and others to help inform our draft guidance. 
In the early winter, we worked in consultation with NOAA NIMFS, state fishery and coastal management agencies, and technical experts to develop the draft guidance, in particular Appendix A, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, we developed our guidance based on the comments we've received. In early spring of this year, BOEM completed its internal review, and we continued to collaborate with our state and federal partners throughout this process. So here in late summer 2022, we have published the draft guidance and we are here discussing with our constituents and partners. The final guidance will be upcoming. Next slide, please. It's important to identify what BOEM's guidance can do. BOEM's guidance can recommend fisheries mitigation processes, including processes for filing claims, timing of initial proposals, it can recommend methodology to determine the sufficiency of funds to compensate fishing communities for negative economic impacts arising from offshore wind energy development activities approved by BOEM. The guidance can propose measures that could result in fair, equitable, and predictable methodologies used by developers for mitigating impacts of offshore wind energy on all offshore renewable energy projects. And it can enforce with the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Compliance, or BESI, it can enforce compliance with contributions proposed by the lessee that were part of the approved constructions and operations plan or other appropriate plan on approval, regardless of the contributions being required by a state or not. Next slide, please. So there are some limitations to what guidance can do. So what can BOEM's guidance not do? BOEM's guidance cannot create a central fund. BOEM lacks the legal authority to create or oversee a central funding mechanism for compensatory mitigation. BOEM also lacks authority to require contributions to a particular compensation fund, absent a previous commitment or obligation for the lessee to do so. For example, if a commitment is under a state contract or, the, or is in the proponent's own proposed COP. Uh, BOEM's guidance cannot administer funds. BOEM lacks the legal authority to hold funds received or assess industry fees for mitigation. BOEM's guidance cannot require regional mitigation. We cannot require a lessee to mitigate regional impacts as part of a COP approval unless the environmental impact analysis demonstrates the regional impacts of the specific project. So the environmental impact analysis must be supported by the record and the effects analysis cannot be based on speculation. Next slide. So the draft guidance addresses the five general areas here. We have a section for general approach, one for project siting, design, navigation, and access, safety measures, environmental monitoring plan, and financial compensation. Next slide. So our general approach, the intent of this measure is to improve lessee communication and transparency with fishing communities that may be impacted by a project's OCS acti activities in order to mitigate potential adverse impacts. Further, early engagement with fishing communities will promote equity and input in the development of mitigation plans for the entire fishing community. So we ask that the lessee engage with commercial and recreational fishing communities prior to engaging in any activity on the lease. And this pre-activity engagement should be respectful of the views of the fishing communities consulted and result in a publicly available document describing the nature of the engagement and how the lessee has or has not adopted measures identified by the fishing communities to mitigate the impacts of the proposed activity. Next slide. The next section in the guidance covers project siting, design, navigation, and access. And there's, um, uh, there's a few parts here. So for static cables, uh, which are ones that are on the seafloor, there's some specific design elements that the guidance covers. All static cables should be buried to a minimum depth of six feet below the seabed and should avoid installation techniques that raise the profile of the seabed. Cable protection measures should, uh, should be used that reflect the pre-existing conditions of the site. So this mitigation measure chiefly ensures that the seafloor cable protection doesn't introduce new obstructions for mobile fishing gear. So it should be trawl friendly with tapered or sloped edges. Uh, if cable protection is necessary in non trawlable habitat, like rocky habitat, then the lessee should consider using materials that mirror the benthic environment. Next slide. 
For dynamic cables, which are used in floating uh, wind technology, the cables should be suspended at a depth that minimizes interactions with, fi with fishing operations. And where feasible, the cables should share corridors to minimize the total cable footprint in the area. Next slide, please. The guidance discusses facility design elements. And in it, the facility design should maximize access to fisheries, including consideration of transit and traditional fishing within the project area, consolidation of infrastructure where practicable to reduce space use conflicts, consideration of larger turbine sizes to reduce total project footprint and still meet energy production commitments, coordination of turbine and substation array layouts between and among neighboring lease areas. Turbine locations should be sited to avoid known sensitive benthic features such as natural and artificial reefs. And planning should use nature inclusive designs where applicable to maximize available habitat for fish. And so nature inclusive designs promote use by fish. So they're often porous and allow settlement of larvae and epifauna, and they can promote the development of refuge for marine species. Uh, next slide, please. The guidance discusses some safety measures, including charting all facilities and obstructions resulting from construction and operations of an offshore wind energy facility and providing that information to NOAA, the Coast Guard, and to navigational software companies. Considering installation techniques and time windows that minimize disruption to fishing activities, like using simultaneous lay and burial or conducting activity during an appropriate time of year based on the species present. Employing liaisons from the commercial fishing industry to provide safety and communication services during construction. Monitoring cable burial in real time and reporting all potential hazards to the Coast Guard as soon as possible. And using digital information technology platforms like smartphone apps to bring together survey and construction schedules and locations in addition to the standard local notices to mariners. Next slide, please. Safety measures also include marking facilities and appurtenances with permanent identification of the project and company, providing training opportunities for the commercial fishing industry to simulate safe navigation through a wind facility in various weather conditions and at various speeds, monitoring safety threats like radar disruption, ice shedding, security threats, and impacts on search and rescue efforts throughout the life of the project. Consulting with the fishing industry and the Coast Guard to identify which structures would be most appropriate for automatic identification system AIS uh, transponders consistent with Bohm's lighting and marking guidelines. And considering lessee funded radar system upgrades for commercial and for higher recreational fishing vessels, for example, solid state Doppler based marine vessel radar systems. Next slide. We did not receive a lot of comments about environmental monitoring. So with the guidance, um, we recommend that lessees work with state and federal fishery management agencies to explore the need and methods to monitor changes in fishing activity as a result of the proposed offshore wind energy development. Uh, we provide recommendations for conducting and reporting the results of baseline collection studies in separate guidelines available at the website here. And in 2021, the Responsible Offshore Science Alliance worked with state, federal, and fisheries constituents to develop offshore wind monitoring framework and guidelines document, which is available at the second link on this site. These documents are an important resource in understanding necessary considerations in developing pre-construction, construction, and post-construction fisheries monitoring surveys. So we wanna emphasize that monitoring biological resource and habitat impacts are addressed through separate guidance and ongoing discussions with regional groups. Um, so that uh, those two documents are a great, great reference. Next slide, please. So another section in the guidance deals with financial compensation and the questions that helped guide us as we drafted this guidance include the types of financial compensation the phases of the offshore wind process, eligibility for a claim, timing consideration for claims, and options for managing funds. Next slide, please. So for types of financial compensation, 
uh, gear loss is one type of, of financial compensation that we considered. And there is a fisheries contingency fund for gear loss that applies to the oil and gas program managed by NOAA Fisheries. Uh, the mitigation measures in this document largely reflect what is found in that document. So the lessee should reimburse for fisheries gear loss resulting from its own action that damages fishing gear. The lessee must honor the review of claims filed within 90 days after the date of the first discovery of the incident. The lessee should fully compensate for the repair or replacement of the damaged gear and up to 50% of gross income loss during the period from the discovery of the lost or damaged gear to when the gear is repaired or replaced. The lessee should also compensate for reasonable fees paid to an attorney, CPA, or other consultant for the preparation of the claim. So an example of this is a lessee contracted survey vessel damaging fishing gear during survey operations. The lessee should also compensate for damaged gear resulting from the fishing industry interacting with non-marked or non-chartered obstructions that are lessee property. Next slide, please. Another type of financial compensation that we considered was lost in, was lost income. And the scope of impacts or losses that should be addressed by compensatory mitigation should be based on the impacts identified in the various environmental documents, including the lessee's construction and operations plan and or the assessments prepared by BOEM analyzing the potential effects of the action proposed in the lessee submitted plan. So at a minimum, consideration should include the construction period, BOEM recommends 100% reimbursement during construction. During the operations period, it should be assumed that there is an adjustment period for fisheries post-construction. BOEM recommends that 100% of revenue exposure be available for claimants for the first year after construction, 80% of revenue exposure available for claimants two years after construction, 70% of revenue exposure available for three years after construction, 60 after four years, and 50 available for five years post-construction. And to be clear, we're talking about the revenue exposure calculations that are used for the reserved funds, which should be held by a third party and dispersed based on claims. During the decommissioning phase, um, since only conceptual decommissioning is evaluated in the COP EIS, BOEM recommends that the decommissioning application that's required contain the measures to mitigate impacts to commercial and recreational fisheries from the decommissioning. So in general, we expect the same principles described under construction would apply here. Next slide. So for management of claims, BOEM recommends that funds be managed by a neutral third party on behalf of the lessee. These funds may be established at the project level, company level if there's multiple projects, or on a regional multi-lessee level. The third party management is not limited to financial responsibilities, but should also process claims. Lessees should not limit claimants to vessel owners and operators. Negatively impacted businesses may include shoreside businesses, such as seafood processors and bait dealers, who can demonstrate in a claim that their business experienced a loss of income due to unrecovered economic activity resulting from displaced fisheries. While BOEM is supportive of claims processes that provide funds more directly to an impacted community for disbursement by the community members, the model in this guidance ensures that funds are received by the impacted businesses and it relies on individual claims. This ensures that claims are commensurate with the impacts of the claimant rather than pooled into a more general fund that may benefit the fishing industry more broadly, or in a model that disperses funds equally amongst a fishing community for the period of impact. Claims should be honored for up to two years after the income loss was experienced. And that's to ensure that the full extent of the loss can be calculated. Next slide, please. The guidance includes something um, called Appendix A, which is the data and methodology report for developing re revenue exposure. And this is applicable only to the Northeast US, the GARCO region. And this is the result of a technical working group that BOEM convened in the fall and early winter. So while the content is BOEMS, the content is reflective of discussions in this data and methodology technical working group. And that working group consisted of state and federal partners. So it essentially recommends that the NIMS GARFO fishery revenue exposure estimates, the fishery footprint, be used as the starting point for developing adequate funds for fulfilling lost income claims. And it provides caveats for different fisheries, including data limited commercial fisheries and recreational fishing. 
And again, it's worth noting that this is really only applicable to the Northeast. Next slide, please. So the draft guidance is available for comment. The public comment period closes on August 22nd. And so we would encourage uh, anyone who is willing to submit a comment. Next slide. The feedback that we are seeking uh, is uh, listed here in this list of questions. So we're seeking comments on all aspects of the draft guidance, but we are particularly interested in feedback on these questions. Is more detail needed in one or more topic areas? And if so, please indicate which area and what more detail is needed. Two, are there other claims processes that would result in equitable treatment of claims and be less onerous? If so, please provide examples. Three, should the guidance provide parameters or examples of documentation suitable for impact claims? And if so, please tell us what that looks like and give us examples of that documentation. Four, should the guidance provide a list of potential third party contractors for funds administration? And if so, who should be on that list? Five, is there additional detail that should be included in the Appendix A methodologies? And six, are the assumptions accurate for determining adequacy of funds? And if not, what assumptions should be incorporated? Next slide, please. So you can give feedback at the link here at regulations.gov. You can just click the link here or type in BOM-2022-0033 and you can type your comment directly into there. Uh, the comment period closes August 22nd. And we've also uh, put our website up here so you can find more information, including the draft guidance, um, a copy of this presentation and a recording. Next slide, please. Um, so um, really quickly, it, should, it says adjourn, but it should say questions. Um, I just want to give you a, a quick timeline for our development. And so next slide, please. So we are here in late summer 2022, collecting feedback on the draft guidance. We will revise the draft guidance based on what we get from the public comments, and then we will issue the final guidance in fall of this year. And with that, uh, I'll say thank you and take any questions. Okay, thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I know that we have plans. Um, Julia with council staff is going to present um, kind of an overview of the comments that we perhaps intend to uh, deliver. But before we get to that, I have some hands that have come up on online and in the room. So we'll take a couple questions at this point. Uh, for Lorena, and I'll start with Michelle Duvall. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thanks for the presentation. And I, I know that this has come up in a couple of the previous public hearings that I've been able to listen to you, but could you clarify where the, uh, with respect to the compensatory mitigation period during operations, where the, the step down uh, from, you know, 100% of revenue exposure in the first year after construction to 80% to 70% to 60%. Where where did that come from? Thanks. Yes, thank you. That's a good question. Um, that came from. There's a lot that goes into it and I'm going to have to. Um, I'm going to have to answer only part of it, but I would be happy to have conversations with you and Brian Hooker, who is the lead biologist for this project when he's back in the office. But the the step down period came from the assumption that there would be um, an adjustment period during the operations plan or during the operations phase of of the offshore wind farm, and the step down came from. Um, I'm trying to remember correctly. I think part of it came from some that we saw in Europe, but mostly the numbers are based on an expectation that use would resume uh, over time. And again, I, I would have to defer to Brian Hooker on this because he was the one very intimately involved in that section. Okay, thanks for that. Um, next, I have Peter Hughes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Council. Good morning, members uh, of the public who are joining us here today. 
uh, I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Um, I, I have so many questions, but I'm kind of going to boil it down to one. Um, and then I have a comment. Um, in your in your presentation, your timeline presentation, late summer, um, you issue you issue final guidance. Um, final guidance to me sounds a bit ominous in the sense that it's final. Um, are there any sunset provisions within the guidance that we're going to open it back up in two years or three years and review this final guidance based on additional information learned from uh, sites being built out? Or is this final guidance? Because that, that to me is, is rather extreme. Uh, and, then I, and then I have a comment after that. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Um, yes, so it says final guidance because this is the draft guidance that we've released. We'll we'll release a, a final version of this um, hopefully in the fall. Uh, it doesn't mean that this guidance is final. The guidance is of course subject to change based on a whole host of things. You know, um, in you know more information, different requirements. Um, that doesn't mean final, permanent, close the book forever. Uh, but there is no specific time frame identified for revisiting it, so it's open ended. Does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, and, and and maybe I'll reach out to Brian at a later date uh, for a little more clarification. But then, I, I, you know, I have a comment, and and, and that comment has to do with uh, one of your slides. I believe it's slide twelve or thirteen. Uh, project siting, design, navigation, and access. And, um, you know, 1 of your 1st bullet points there is that, uh, um, uh, developers should take into consideration transit and traditional fishing within the project area. Um, you know, we could probably replace traditional fishing with historical fishing, which might be a little more accurate. Um, because we fish in relatively the same places year after year, um, because the fish congregate in those areas. I find it interesting that this is the guidance that BOEM has provided for the developers, yet BOEM has not taken this, their own guidance into consideration when citing wind energy areas and take the New York Bight as a perfect example. You've cited a, a, a wind energy area in the New York Bight, which is huge, huge historical significance and probably where most of our seafood comes from on the East Coast. Another site that, that BOEM has identified is off the Delaware Bay, the mouth of the Delaware Bay, that's in the Carl N. Schuster Horseshoe Crab Sanctuary. We're gonna plop a site right on a sanctuary that this council worked with the states and worked with the Atlantic States Marine Fishery Commission to identify this historical uh, migratory pathway for horseshoe crabs and offer them protections. They are some of the oldest living fossils known to man and the highest concentration of them is in the mouth of the Delaware Bay. So I find it interesting that uh, that the guidance provided by Bohm to the developers is guidance that Bohm yet did not take into consideration for themselves. And 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 that's my comment. I've got plenty more but I got plenty more questions but I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Yeah, thanks Peter. Appreciate the comment. Um I'm going to move on to, I've got three other hands from council members and then try to provide an opportunity for the public, but we still have to um, dedicate some time for Julia uh, and feedback to her regarding uh, potential comments. So I'm going to go next to Kate Wilkie and then Eric Reed, you're on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you for the presentation. My question relates to the regional, to regional mitigation. Is regional mitigation possible in the case of New York Bite, given the PEIS? Uh, I can't speak specifically for the New York by PEIS, but regional mitigation would be an option if it's a clearly identified impact in the environmental assessments associated with any project. So if a project can identify and show a non-speculative link to regional impacts, then regional mitigation may be an option. Okay, thank you. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I have uh, my, my initial question is about uh, the comment that you made about uh, mitigation is not going to be 
based on uh, speculation. I think that's what I heard, and I think I just heard that in your response to Ms. Wilkie. Is that correct? That's correct. Mitigation needs to be tied to impacts, um, and the impacts cannot be speculative. Okay, so then I think I find it very interesting, and maybe you can clarify your, your thought process. Uh, in Dr. Duvall's question, we, when she talked about the step down, that's based on, and I think you said, speculating that fishing would return. So, uh, how come it's good for you and not good for us? <laughs> I apologize if I missed. To be honest with you, I, I don't even know why I ask these questions because half the time you don't listen to us anyway, but that's my question. Thank you. No, thank you for your comment, and I apologize if I misspoke. We expect that there will be a return to use in the area post construction. Yeah, but you're, we can't, you can't allow us to speculate or, or use anecdotal information based on historical fishing presence, but yet you're speculating that we're going to go back in there when, I mean, I'd be interested to see what Lloyds of London, who ensures almost the entire fishing fleet in the United States, says about that. They're the one that's going to make the decision on whether we go in there or not, and, and that's a fact. So, and that's not speculation; that's fact. Okay, thanks, Eric. Uh, next, Paul Risi. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, under safety measures, it's mentioned providing training opportunities for commercial fishing industry in simulation and that's great but moving down on the same frame it's considering uh lessee funded radar system upgrades so training is awesome but if they're not going to provide radars that can see through these wind fields it's uh it's it's a bad follow-up i would like to see considering change to providing as in the uh, the second point. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, that that's that's the kind of comment we're looking for. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks for that question, Paul. And if I could ask Kate, Eric, and Paul to put their hands down, it would help me uh, manage the the interest for comment. So, seeing no additional comment from members of the council. Uh, can I get a show of hands from the audience here that's participating in in the room that might want to comment? I see Megan, and I've got a couple hands online. So, let, Megan, why don't you go first, and then I'll go to the online um, participants, and then we'll turn to Julia after we have Julie Evans, Jeff Kalin, and James Fletcher, and then we'll We'll end it there and move on to Julia's presentation. Go ahead, Megan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan Lapp, Seafreeze. Um, I have a question for Baum. Why does the compensation lessen over time? It diminishes over time in the draft mitigation document. Can you explain that, please? Yeah, the, the Changes in the compensation are tied to resumed use of the area. So we do not believe that when a wind farm is constructed, that fishing will never again happen there, that over time fishing can continue to happen. And so the compensation is meant to transition during that time when income loss may be experienced. So in the United Kingdom, which is like the only country in the world that allows commercial fishing in a wind farm, um, trawl vessels, mobile bottom tier gear um, vessels still do not operate in the wind farms 20 years after their construction. Um, they receive notices both from the governmental information service and the wind farm companies themselves stating to stay away from cables, do not operate mobile bottom tending gear near cables because doing so can cause serious risk of loss of life. So due to safety concerns um, and notices from developers and the government itself, um, trawl vessels and mobile bottom tending gear vessels do not operate in those wind farms. Um, so the assumption that fishing will just over time be able to resume in there 
um, is not borne out by fact or experience in other parts of the world where this has occurred. So that is a very, very serious flaw in this document, um, as well as the fact that over time, BOEM con continues to lease and approve projects. So cumulative impacts increase over time. They do not decrease over time. Um, so basically the assumption in the document is completely backwards from reality. Um, I will also say just for the benefit of the council members around the table that the impacts to shoreside businesses such as processors is expected to be one to two percent of the X vessel value um, that is estimated for an area which is extremely ludicrous. Um, I cannot afford to operate a business, pay salaries, pay labor, pay electric, pay packaging costs, maintenance costs, um, fuel costs, and shipping costs on a penny on the dollar to what I pay the boat. Um, we have various studies for various fisheries managed by this council that have been done through the Science Center for Marine Fisheries that show economic impacts and multipliers for various fisheries. For the um, longfin squid fishery, the economic multiplier for shoreside business as compared to the X vessel value was 7.6. So for every dollar of X vessel revenue, there were 7.6 dollars um, added because of shoreside impacts. So to say one to two percent a penny on the dollar is completely, completely um, beyond inaccurate. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Megan, for your comment. Um, I don't see, there are no other hands in the, in the audience. Uh, so I'm gonna go ahead to a few online questions. I wanna start with Julie Evans. Um, hello, I hope you can hear me. We can I, hear um, you, go ahead, Julie. Yeah, okay, thank you. Um, Wow, what a topic. You know, I've been involved in this since 2017 in all issues, uh, all aspects of this issue. And for sure, with our our wind farm, um, you know, uh, started uh, before then here in East Hampton, and I am the East Hampton Town Fisheries representative to the agencies uh, involved in this. Um, I represented our local fishermen, um, both for hire and uh, commercial. And, um, you know, um, the comments made by Peter and Megan are very, uh, should be taken very seriously because those were part of the issues that we saw when, you know, some of the survey vessels took down gear for local um, lobster fishermen, pot fishermen, even in areas where there were no um, planned uh, wind farms. So, um, and we still don't know why they were, what they were doing in those areas that they could uh, affect um, the loss of gear. Um, I have to say that um, um, going forward, this document should have um, some sort of uh, um, allowability for change because this is a, a new industry. We really don't know what's gonna happen here with this. We, we really don't know. And um, as evidenced by my experience trying to get fishermen paid, trying to get them compensated, it was not an easy uh, uh, go of it. Um, um, and I, I do appreciate Bohm for trying to put something um, concrete down because uh, unfortunately for our fishermen, and for me, um, the um, applications would change, but they wouldn't let us know. So we'd be working on one application for a fisherman and, and um, the wind farm people um, would change it uh, and we wouldn't know. And so perhaps, and then they would use the 90 days as an excuse not to pay. It, it hasn't been easy. I don't expect it to be easy going forward and I, don't think you should put anything as a final um, say on, on what's going to happen. Um, that's one thing. And I have many, everybody wants to move on to other topics, but the, um, uh, the, the, the problem um, here is also for being, we are uh, 
uh, commercial for hire, recreational industries in a, in a highly sought after resort town. We are the playground of the rich and famous here in, in, in from New York City. So um, how, if, the, if this affects commercial fishermen and they're not able to supply restaurants or um, food mar fish markets with fish, how will um, um, that the, our economy survive? You know, and this also ties into like ec ecological damages, you know, that might possibly happen. Um, there are real estate issues when they're, they're digging, you know, for the cable placements um, down, down private roads. We've, we've gone through all this for, for since 2017. We, we haven't won any of the minor battles, including getting fishermen paid, pretty much. We haven't won any. So I would like to feel more confident in that BOEM is really looking out for us, that, that this group is looking out for our fishermen, because we were the first. We were the first to go through this. Um, we'll be the first in many other areas on this issue. So um, I, I, my experience tells me um, that I shouldn't expect too much because in the end, it's not about the fish, it's about politics. And thank you for letting me speak. Yeah, thank you, Julie, for your comment. Um, I have Bonnie Brady in the audience, Bonnie. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. I think something that's definitely missing in this document is the concept of retroactive for projects that are already been approved, um, specifically for the South Fork Wind Farm, which Julie spoke about before. There has been zero, zero compensation for the commercial fishermen that fish in that wind energy area, which is Cox's Ledge, a huge cod spawning ground for the fishermen from at least Rhode Island and New York and Connecticut that fish in the area of the 56 mile cable, you know, and there's nothing. The Forstead gave them the town of East Hampton that included the town trustees that are only in charge of the land out to, I believe, 1,400 feet, $29 million. They gave nothing to the fishermen that are going to be severely impacted because, as we know, as Megan mentioned before, there's a whole site online in Europe called kingfisher.net, and I can give the link, and you can go in there and you can plug in renewables and you can see what areas of the UK have free spans in them, which areas have exposures, which areas have found unexploded ordinances. Every single month they've had it for years. They know there's going to be cables exposed and they just bury their own head in the sand and ignore us. For fishermen that trawl in that area and it's, you know, everyone all the way down because it's coming from Cox's Ledge all the way around Montauk Point, 14 miles into Wayne Scott. So that's a huge amount of trawl fishermen that are going to be affected and they're getting bubkis. And if you all have heard on other calls, I spoke to Director Lefton and she chose to ignore me. In fact, I think the council meeting beforehand in New Jersey, I brought up the same subject about retroactively compensating and that does not exist to date. Um, also, just as a matter of fact, I know that OSPAR, which was the convention in Europe in the 1990s that started doing scientific work on the offshore wind that existed then, they specifically said that for any benthic habitat to go back to its pre-jet plowed state takes on average five years. I find it somewhat incredulous that Bohm is saying, oh, well, then things will be fine. We all know that most trawlers cannot risk losing their gear and or flipping their boat. So what will eventually happen is not only will the areas <clears throat> that are fished become less, but there will be higher concentration of fishing in smaller areas, which will affect many more fishermen 
than just in the area of the cable. And I think that needs to be addressed also. Thank you. Thanks, Bonnie. Okay, I'm going to go next to Jeff Kalin and then James Fletcher and then Pete Himchek. We'll cut comment at that point and we'll bring it back to the council table. And then we also still have Julia's presentation. Go ahead. Um, who did I say was next? Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah thanks, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thank you, Mike. Uh, good morning, council. Um, so I'm Jeff Kalin with um, Lunds Fisheries in Cape May. and. And I just wanted to speak to a couple of documents that, well, one document that the bone presentation and Marina, by the way, you're in a really tough position. So don't take any of this personally, um, but uh, it's unfortunate. And I, I, I won't, I guess I'll turn it, put this in, in, in the form of a question to begin, but why didn't the presentation focus on appendix A, um, which is not easy to find that provides the methodology for developing the revenue exposure estimates um, in, you know, as a foundation of the compensation plan. That's a question. And then I wanted to comment, Mr. Chairman, on, on what that document says. So I don't mean to put you on the spot, uh, but anyway, what, what it is, and I, I, I hope the council will take a look at it. And I think while you're putting your comments together, It'll be important to, to take a look at that. And at page six on shoreside seafood businesses, this multiplier of one to two percent is stated. And you know, we've been on the webinars. Um, I think uh, it was said that it comes from uh, the agency. But as Megan said, uh, we've done several uh, economic studies of the values of these fisheries through the Science Center for Marine Fisheries, uh, the National Science Foundation Supported Industry University Partnership. And we've used um, uh, two or three dif different economists to, to take a look at these multipliers. And we're putting uh, their comments together that we'll submit to BOEM. Unfortunately, you know, this comment period is so truncated, but uh, we, they'll be responding specifically to that issue of the one to 2% which is really the foundation of how, how all this, you know, goes in the future relative to compensation. So with fluke, the multipliers is seven times X vessel value with scup, it's 10 times X vessel value, 18 times with the clams, 7.6 as Megan said, and four times on Menhaden, which you guys don't manage, but it is another fishery that's going to be displaced. Even the purse chains can't operate inside these areas and i know this firsthand because i went to the mytag simulator uh that orsted invited us to to see the 96 uh windmill farm that's going to be offshore here and anybody who's been a mariner knows that we're not taking our fishing gear in there um and it, it's going to be chaos so we're pretty much out of there so the multiplier is very very large it's not a little amount and and we hope that we can bring this those like that idea forward. You know, another thing that happened on this that you might not know about council is the Office of Advocacy of the Small Business Administration held a meeting on August 4th on this issue and developed some comments from the public. And I, I would hope, Mike, that that, that could be reviewed uh, by the council, you know, as you develop your comments uh, before the 22nd, as we'll be doing. And then finally, it was mentioned that this was kicked off by a, a group of states who who uh, really wanted to see kind of a regional approach to uh, the mitigation. I mean, you know, mitigation, that's pretty much out of the barn right now. I think we're really having to focus on compensation because many of us believe we won't be able to be in there. And anyway, on July 12th, there was a meeting of this uh, Connecticut, New York, New Jersey, Virginia fishing participants and BOEM on this mitigation strategy was facilitated. And there is several pages of comments and uh, around uh, the lack of accumulative impact analysis, um, time frames for submitting claims being truncated, uh, not referring to the National Academy of Sciences offshore wind and radar study 
the multiplier effect, as I mentioned. And then finally, I'll, I'll just say, as I've been thinking about this, uh, the recommendation that came out of that group, and again, I hope that Julia or whoever's going to write the comments will take a look at that, um, supporting the idea that for five years, um, there would be 100% fishing loss um, made up by the developers. And I think at that point, you could have a regional review of how, how well that worked. Um, I totally agree with the uh, with, 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 with Chairman Reed, um, that, uh, this isn't speculation, uh, on our part, and we have hard economic numbers, uh, that as individuals who are affected, we can provide that data. And, uh, right now, Bohm seems to be intentionally lowballing the whole issue. And with the billions spent on these leases, it shouldn't be too difficult to compensate us for permanent loss over, let's say, a 30-year period, maybe longer. Um, but thanks for letting me make the comment. I know you're looking for questions, but this is an extremely important, this is one of the most important um, initiatives by BOEM that we've seen in the several years we've all been watching BOEM webinars. So thanks for letting me make those comments. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jeff. Thanks for your comments. and. Uh, Julia, I'm sure, is taking all of this in uh, as far as the comments that we plan to send. So just know that. I'm going to go next to James Fletcher. I appreciate it. I'll try to keep it short and sweet. I have been concerned about the electromagnetic fields of the transmission cable for years. I have presented evidence from England where the fish stop going inland up the rivers in the migration. The eels moving up, the European eel or the American eel are affected by the electromagnetic. Now it comes to my attention that the shape of the piles, the question is one of them, not all of them, can the shape of the piles be shifted from round to something like diamond to stop the water? Because in the depth of water, you have different temperatures. And this number of piles for the windmills are going to totally upset that flow of water down current. In other words, the eggs that should be on the surface to hatch are going to get stirred up and moved down current the temperature of the water from the bottom to the top, down current of the windmills are going to change drastically. And the problem is that the piles are going to upset it. Has any second question, have any tanks or, or things been done to see how much the current mixes from the top to the bottom. And, and all, the last question, and I've tried to get an answer, would Bowen give any grants for an alternative method to generate current that is, does not use windmills? I've asked a couple of times and been laughed at, not even answered, just laughed at. So I guess the answer is no. But if there is an alternative way to generate current, would other than windmills, would Bowen offer a grant to do it? Thank you for your time. Thank the council for their time. But people on the council, if the eggs floating on the surface get mixed down below these things, down current, we are not going to get the spawning of fish. And I'll bring this up as the last thing and is not in on Bowen, but the chemicals that we're putting in the water in layers, if we mix those up, the survival of the eggs is going to further decrease. So thank you for your time. Thanks, James. I appreciate that. Um, okay, we're going to wrap up public comment right now with Peter Hemchek. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I trust you can hear me. Uh, so I'll be very quick. Uh, I sp I'm speaking for La Monica Pine Foods, vertically integrated uh, harvester and processor of surf clams. 
So we know we know that with the wind energy areas in the Garfo region, that a number of long-term well-established fishery independent surveys will have to adjust, will have to be modified, will have to be recalibrated, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what, what happens when this happens? Scientific uncertainty increases. Uh, what does that lead to? Precautionary management. What does that lead to? Well, the OFL may go down, the ABC may go down, the ACL may be gone. You may have lower quotas for fishermen as a result of having to modify all these surveys. And this is one facet that hasn't been mentioned today. And uh, I think you need to get the SSC involved if you're gonna write comments on behalf of the council to uh, put out this fact. And uh, God knows how you would ever estimate the loss. I mean, if quotas go down, uh, everybody in that fishery is going to suffer. So having an open end to this strategy uh, may be very important when you see quotas being reduced because of scientific uncertainty. Thank you. OK, thank you, Peter. Um, Give me one second. Getting questions from all sorts of and all sorts of ways here today. Uh, let's bring it back to the council at this point right now. And I'm going to go to Dewey and then Julia, if you're going to, you'll hopefully you're ready to go uh, after Dewey's comment. Go ahead, Dewey. Yeah, thank you. And uh, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for your presentation. Um, thing that kind of brings me back around to this guidance is you don't see you don't see the words shall and will in this guidance you see a lot of recommendations and that's uh that, that I don't really I, I I would rather have some guidance that have a completed document that shall and will to hold um uh, folks accountable also uh you say for the Garfo region, is this for Garfo managed species or what this draft mitigation uh, compensation guidance is uh, entails? Hi. Um, yeah, so the Appendix A is primarily applicable to the Garfo region, uh, but the guidance itself is intended to be a little bit broader applied. So um, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to be useful for the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific seaboard when it's time. Um, these measures are guidance, they are not regulations. So the intention here is to provide developers with a cohesive set of guidelines so that there's consistency and um, you know, integrity across projects. When the developers submit their COPS, they will, you know, include these mitigation measures. And when they're a part of the COP, they become enforceable. So I hope that answers your question. I'd, I'd be happy to discuss this more. There's a lot of nuance to it. Um, so feel free to reach out if you need to. Yeah, that does answer my question. But I, I, I will say that uh, uh, particularly to the draft uh, out now for area E and F for the Central Atlantic, uh, that type of mitigation is not going to, if wind, if wind turbines are built in area E and F uh, off the Central Atlantic coast, uh, it won't over time get better. It would be a closed area for pelagic longline industry. So that type of compensation would be a closed area. It wouldn't be that once they're built in a couple years, you go back in there because that gear is not compatible. Uh, with wind turbines floating or fixed. So I would also hope that, that y'all would also look at some guidance for your offshore areas, particularly to HMS of areas that are effective. And if you have less uh, domestic seafood, you'll have more imported seafood that don't have to fish by the same standards as the U.S. fishermen. So that would be, uh, uh, wouldn't be very good. So I, I would make sure that when you're looking at this, that, that you also encompass areas that are not going to be conducive or compatible 
to the fishing gear if, if wind turbines are floating or fixed or placed there. Thank you. And that was area E and F. Okay. Okay, thanks, Dewey. I appreciate that. Okay, we're going to go next uh, to Julia. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I should be ready to go. I think you can hear me, but let me know if I'm too quiet or anything. Um, so, uh, the as um, Lorena said, there's an open comment period, and staff are moving forward with the draft comment letter because we assume that council would have a lot that you would all want to say on this. Um, and we're working on this as a joint comment letter with the New England Council and the South Atlantic Council. Um, so, this is still a draft. Um, it's due by August um, 22nd, um, and it, it's a draft with the um, the other two councils. So we're just I'm just going to provide some kind of high level bullet points of things that's in the draft so far, and then give you the opportunity to provide feedback. But because it's um, you know a work in progress, and we're working on it with these two other councils, I'm hoping that the feedback that you provide that you can kind of give staff the flexibility to wordsmith and work on it to make sure we come up with something that works for all three councils to have it be a joint letter. Um, I'm listening to the conversation just now. I'm, I'm hoping that when you hear what I'm going to summarize, you think that hopefully we accurately predicted some of the concerns that you all have, but um, definitely open to feedback to things that you think um, should be said a little differently or additional things to add in here. So next slide. Um, so the so just kind of general comments that we have in this draft letter so far is that we think it would be appropriate for the councils to say that they support the development of this guidance. Um, it provides clarity on BOEM's recommendations for how to mitigate for fisheries impacts, and this is something that has been lacking so far. So it's if nothing else, it's really helpful just to have these statements from BOEM saying that we do recommend these specific things and make it clear that that these are recommendations that should be considered. It's also a step towards greater consistency across projects, and that's something that we've asked for in probably every wind comment letter that we've written to BOEM. Um, and in addition, many of the specific details in the draft guidance do align with recommendations um, that are in the council's own wind energy policies and that we've said in prior council recommendations. So um, we think for these reasons, there's uh, you know, the councils would probably want to express support for some of the um, concepts that are in this draft guidance. Next slide. Um, that said, we, um, we are expecting that the council would want to say that there's several areas that could be improved or clarified or made more specific. Um, so, for example, um, it BOEM has made it very clear that this is just guidance. It's not requirements. The requirements will come into play when the um, constructions and operation plans are considered for approval for each individual project. But at this stage, this is just generating guidance for things that could be considered to develop those individual project requirements. So with the understanding that this is just guidance and it's not requirements, um, we are suggesting that the council letter um, indicate that the language should be made stronger. Um, so for example, there's, um, phrases in the draft guidance right now that say things like, you know, this sort of thing should be considered or developers should make reasonable efforts to do X, Y, and Z. And that that, that sort of language could be replaced with should. Developers should do X, Y, Z. You know, this is just guidance. Um, so we think the guidance could be made stronger in that way. Um, as was brought up during the discussion, there's um, an inability to address regional mitigation and cumulative impacts um, unless uh, individual projects contribution to a regional, a regional impact or cumulative impact can be assessed and measured. Um, and we're not clear, it, it's not clear to us how that would be done. We're not aware of that being done before. So um, it, it would be helpful for BOEM to provide more information on how that might be done. How will an individual project's contribution to a regional effect or cumulative impact be assessed? Um, because the councils, we've said in um, many comment letters in the past that the councils are very concerned about cumulative impacts. So it will be very important to consider the best way to 
um, analyze an individual project's contribution to a cumulative effect in order to um, have that be compensated for. Also, as um, was come up during this discussion just now, that the guidance should be updated periodically as our understanding of impacts evolves, because of, for, of course, there's going to be more and more projects built over time. So we'll be able to better understand what are the actual impacts um, and that the guidance should be updated to reflect our improved understanding over time. Next slide. Um, so next, just stepping through the sections of the guidance itself, um, there's a section on project siting, design, navigation, and access. Many of the recommendations in this section do align with the council's wind policies and previous council comments. So Lorena um, summarized what's in this section. So some examples of things that align with recommendations that councils have made in the past include things like shared cable corridors, um, using fewer but larger turbines to minimize the footprint of the project while generating the same amount of electricity. Um, if there's a need for cable protection measures, the materials um, used should reflect pre-existing conditions. Structures placed in the water should use nature-inclusive designs. Those are all things that are in the draft guidance right now that the council has recommended in the past. Um, but of course, the first step towards any of this is to first cite the projects where fisheries interactions are minimized. Um, another example in the draft guidance that we think the councils might want to comment on is this recommendation for a minimum six foot cable burial depth. And um, the councils have commented in the past about concerns related to cables um, and their impacts on fishing operations, on fishery surveys related to EMF impacts. So the councils have commented in the past that cables should be buried to a sufficient depth to try to minimize all those impacts, but the councils have not endorsed a specific depth. So assuming that six feet um, is sufficient to address those impacts, then in the comment letter, we're suggesting that um, the council say that, you know, all constructions and operations plans should be updated to reflect a minimum burial depth of six feet because there's multiple construction and operation plans that already exist for East Coast projects that include a range of potential burial depths and um, there's shallower depths than six feet within the range. So this is an example of something that once the guidance is finalized, that it would be helpful to then update all of the constructions and operations plans to reflect um, this guidance. Next slide. Um, as Lorena said, there's a section on safety measures. In our draft comment letter so far, we don't really have a lot to say about that because everything in there seems like things that the councils would support. Um, the section after that is on environmental monitoring. Um, and the draft comment letter so far references the Mid-Atlantic and New England Council wind policies because there's some research and monitoring recommendations in those wind policies that could be incorporated into the guidelines. Um, so, for example, there's language about monitoring that should occur for the life of the project. Um, research and monitoring should be coordinated across projects so that um, the data could be kind of considered collectively um, and that the data should be made publicly available. Also, um, the draft letter so far includes a recommendation that monitoring for socioeconomic impacts, um, guidelines related to that should be further developed. Um, and that the final guidance should specify the objectives and the frequency of environmental monitoring. Next slide. Um, and then the last big section in the guidance document is financial compensation. So the draft letter so far um, says that a compensation fund and process should be established for all projects. The guidance uses language like a, a fund should be considered if income losses are likely, but um, we are imagining that the councils will want to say in this letter that all projects will have some impacts on fisheries. So compensation should be planned for, funds should be set aside um, you know, from the beginning with the assumption that there will be some impacts. And it's not a question of if, in, if income um, losses are likely because some income will be impacted. Um, the draft guidance states that, the, th this was kind of mentioned earlier, but the scope of the impacts that can be addressed by compensatory mitigation should be based on impacts identified in various environmental documents analyzing each project. 
um, this kind of gets at that like speculative aspect that the impacts need to be quantified and analyzed and in a document. Um, but the guidance doesn't specify which document. So it doesn't say like it has to be the final EIS. Um, there's a few documents that analyze impacts of the projects that are used in different ways. So um, in our draft comments, um, we think it might be helpful to ask for clarifications on things like which documents could meet this requirement and what happens if there's two relevant documents that show slightly different um, information that would be used to inform that. And then if there's new or updated or more comprehensive information that is available, you know, after whatever the document is, is finalized, especially after a project is built, we get a more, a better understanding of things or just a few additional years of data kind of changes our understanding of what the previous document said, um, how will that be considered? Um, and, you know, hopefully that the compensation wouldn't be overly um, tied to one specific document um, that it, it can be um, updated and additional information can be considered. And kind of along those same lines, um, the draft comment letter recommends that um, fi the final guidance should include considerations for unexpected impacts. So if you have your specific document that says these are what we, what, these are what the impacts are predicted to be, and then something else happens, um, how is that going to be addressed? Next slide. Um, there was a good discussion about this five year time frame for phasing out compensation due to fisheries adaptation. We predicted that the councils would want to comment that that might not sufficiently address all impacts. And the draft comment letter does include language along the lines of some individual fisheries will not adapt as well as other fisheries. Some captains might choose to just stop fishing altogether. And so that's not going to allow for adaptations. So those sorts of nuances need to be considered. And again, the short concerns about the shoreside multipliers, further development is likely needed there. There's the example 1 to 2% multiplier in the draft guidelines. There's not a lot of justification provided with that. Um, we acknowledge that this is an area where there's not like a standard agreed upon method for how to develop these multipliers. But this is something that warrants further development because these shoreside businesses will be impacted and should be mitigated and compensated for. And the appropriate multipliers will likely vary by fishery, so that needs to be a consideration. Um, and then in addition, further development is needed on the process for evaluating and compensating impacts to data poor fisheries. Next slide. Um, the draft guidelines suggest that fishermen could be allowed up to two years to submit claims. Um, in the draft letter so far, we have language suggesting that maybe that time period should be longer than two years um, because the guidelines or the guidance, the draft guidance suggests that the, the claims would need to be based on kind of like final official data. And as we all know, in the fisheries world, sometimes there can be lengthy QA and QC timelines for getting final data. Um, so if, if um, fishermen are needing to access their like official data through whatever program is deemed appropriate, there used to be time for the QA, QC, and then uh, especially in the early years of using, you know, this new system for compensating impacts and captains requesting their own information from whatever agency, if, if that's how it's going to play out, there might be kind of like a learning curve there in the early years of the program. Um, so a time period of more than two years might be helpful for that, those reasons. Um, also, the guidance should outline steps that will be taken if the guidelines are not followed, if sufficient funds are not set aside, if valid claims are not honored, and for other reasons. So, for example, there could be um, establishment of an appeals process. Um, and then also the final guidance should clarify that mitigation funds are different than community agreements. So, um, there's, you know, been been some agreements set up with wind developers and individual communities to provide benefits to those communities, but those are different than these um, these fishery mitigation funds that these guidelines are trying to address, and that should be, you know, made clear that those community agreements do not, you know, fill the need for fisheries mitigation. Next slide. Um, so that that's the quick summary of what's in the draft comment letter so far. I also just wanted to note that there was one 
comment letter that we received related to this that's um, linked with the briefing materials. And that was a comment letter from Surfside Foods. Um, and that letter expressed concern that the surf clam fishery will lose access to important fishing areas, even with mitigation measures. Um, so measures related to the design of projects, how far apart are the turbines spaced, things like that. The letter suggests that even with all those considerations, the fishery will lose access and this will result in major loss of income. And um, considering that the letter recommends resource enhancement outside of lease areas be fully explored as a mitigation measure before compensation. And there's a link to a, or a summary report um, related to um, seeding surf clams from hatchery production. And so kind of suggesting that um, that those sorts of efforts could be supported and funded um, related to this, this whole discussion here of impacts. Um, next slide. Um, so that's all I had. Again, the objective for this discussion was just to kind of give you a heads up of what staff are working on in terms of comments um, that the councils um, could make in terms of this draft mitigation guidance. And again, we're working on this as three councils together. Um, so any uh, major changes to the draft letter would need to be reviewed by leadership at all three councils. Um, and we're hoping that you are comfortable giving staff the flexibility to just the staff among the three councils kind of work together um, to address the concerns that you have. And then um, leadership at the councils can review the letter before it's finalized and sent off. And that's all I had. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julia. Appreciate your summary of uh, what you've put together so far. I'm gonna go to the council first, see if there are any additional questions or comments uh, or discussion on what Julia presented, Adam Nowalski. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. So one thing that's come out of this discussion this morning is that you and I have very different definitions of rapid fire agenda items. Uh, that being said, I appreciate the input uh, that everybody's provided so far, as well as the comments from Julia that she provided. I think there's two things that I'd like to see the councils offer additional comment on. I support the minimum death of the cable burial, uh, but I would also support comments regarding monitoring as well as real-time reporting of known exposures. Uh, so I would pass that along to council staff for uh, consideration of inclusion. Uh, the second item that I think is worthy of consideration is we've heard a lot of talk about radar upgrades for vessels, uh, particularly on the recreational for hire side. Uh, we all know that these radars are very expensive. They're subject in large part to availability of electrical components right now. Uh, installations are time consuming, expensive, and also require installation. Uh, we see that there's a desire to have AIS installations on the uh, turbines themselves with the expectations that recreational vessels and other vessels transiting the areas would have receivers. What I think should be included is a recommendation for AIS transceiver installations on recreational vessels, including the four higher vessels. Uh, the AIS transceivers would allow for the real-time transmission of the recreational vessels that are transiting the area's locations. Uh, all other vessels that have the receivers would then be able to see them. Uh, it's as simple as a graphic popping up on a screen somewhere. Uh, these systems are much less expensive to purchase. Uh, they are less intrusive in terms of an installation. Uh, the radar transmissions often affect other equipment on the vessel, uh, and there's also going to be less training involved. So I would support uh, a recommendation from the technology-wise of not just looking at the radars, uh, but looking at the AIS transceiver installations on the vessels as well. Thank you. Thanks for the comment, Adam, and I very much appreciate the the, uh, the interest in moving things forward. So you you know your comment will be the reason why we don't take a break in between uh, in between presentations. So thank you for that, um, and you can all blame Adam for that. Um, anyone else around the table have any additional comments for Julia? We've heard a lot of really good points being made, uh, both from the public. And the council at this point, and as as was noted, there is an opportunity to send your comments in uh, as a written comment. 
as well as providing them here today. So seeing none at this time and in the interest of time, uh, I'd like to move on at this point. Thank you, uh, Julia and um, Lorena for your presentations and, and uh, appreciate you being here or being with us today uh, virtually. <clears throat> Yeah, I just noticed, uh, I looked down, that I do have a couple co additional comments. So why don't we take them, if you can just be very brief in your comment uh, before we move on to our next item on the agenda. So Rick, maybe you can get yourself teed up and ready to go. Uh, we'll turn to you in just a minute. But uh, I have uh, Kaylin. I don't, we don't hear anything. Kaylin, if you're still there with us. Okay, let's go to Julie. You have something quickly, Julie? Uh, yes, yes, sir, I do. Um, thank you for letting me speak again. Um, um, the way this is written as mere suggestions has been the problem in the past for um, our fishermen, commercial for hire, recreational out here in East Hampton. Um, and as I represent them, the Fisheries Advisory Committee for the town of East Hampton, if this has no teeth, um, it's going to be a hard sell for me. Anyway, I just thought I would reiterate that as we close. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. And uh, in giving folks a second crack at the bite at the apple, Bonnie, did you have one? You had one quick point you wanted to make? Thank you very much. Yes, Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. One other item that I think the council may want to address in their letter is that the cables that are coming within the wind farm areas and also the cables that are coming onto land, in often cases, if they can't dig them deep enough, they are going to be armoring them with boulders, riprap, et cetera. So that's basically, for some cases, going to be a complete taking of commercial fishing grounds. And also when they prepare to lay the cables, in some cases they're removing boulders. And those boulders, depending upon the specific um, wind energy area and which state, whether it's in New York, it's an Article 7 process that talks about those cables in state waters, but also in the federal, they can move them anywhere from 80 feet from where they started up to 200 feet where they started and we're talking boulders that in some cases are quite large. So there's going to be a lot of movement if there happens to be boulders in an area where they may not just lay the cable on the floor, they're gonna to try to move these boulders. So that's gonna change a lot of the makeup and I think the council needs to be made aware of that. Thank you. Okay, thanks Bonnie. All right, moving on to the next item on our agenda, we have a presentation I would like to welcome Rick Robbins back to the table, former council member and chairman um, many years ago. Uh, and we also are here with uh, Deidre Bulky, working with Rick. Um, and we're looking forward to your presentation, Rick, on community offshore wind projects. So whenever you're ready, Rick. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members. Good morning. Um, we, we really appreciate the opportunity to provide a, a quick introduction today on the community offshore wind project. I'm, I'm, Marine Affairs Manager for RWE and Community Offshore Wind. I'm joined by Dear Bulky on our fisheries team, and uh, we appreciate the opportunity. Um, we're mindful of your time on the agenda today, and we'll uh, provide a quick presentation and look forward to uh, further follow-up discussions after the meeting. Um, so by way of background, I'll just give a quick overview of the area and the site identification process, but on February 23rd of this year, uh, BAM held an auction for six offshore wind leases, as you're aware, in the New York Bight. And lease area 539 was awarded to Community Offshore Wind, a joint venture of RWE Renewables and National Grid Ventures. Um, there are a few things I'd like to point out about the site identification process. Um, and I know the council followed this closely, and a lot of the members of the fishing industry followed this with uh, close interest and input. 
Um, there were there were several important considerations around Area 539, specifically ensure that uh, BOEM in their proposed sale notice had an area called 540 that had a lot of fairly intensive surf fam activity. Um, surf fam ministry raised specific concerns around that. Um, seaward of uh, what you see now is the final area. Um, there were also a couple of specific fishery considerations. Um, one is the fact that the area originally abutted the uh, AAA, so it, it was right up against the mid-Atlantic access area for sea scallops. Um, and there was also along the eastern edge there um, a bit of shelf scarp that the uh, a piece of habitat that the National Marine Fisheries Service expressed concern over. Um, the the sea scallop industry asked for a buffer specifically uh, along the eastern edge of the area between that and the AAA. Um, Bone made several significant adjustments to the final area. They eliminated the inshore area that, that had the most surf clamming in it, which was area 540. Uh, the remaining portion of that was integrated into 539, and they implemented a two and a half nautical mile wide buffer on the eastern edge um, between the lease area and the scallop area. And that had the effect of taking one of the most intensively scalloped areas out. It also accounted for that bit of shelf scarp habitat there on the eastern side. So what we see in this is, uh, you know, some, uh, I think, increased responsiveness um, in the siting process relative to those specific fisheries considerations. They also, on the front end, implemented transit corridors or corridors that are about 2.4 nautical miles in width that are on the northern and southern edge of 539 uh, to accommodate transits. So in, in this case, uh, a number of actions have been taken before the lease was issued to deconflict uh, some of the fisheries considerations. Just a, a few points about the area. It's 125,000 acres. Uh, it, it's an area that will support three gigawatts of, of output, which will provide clean power for up to 1.1 million homes in the region. Its location is roughly 50 nautical miles southeast of New York and 29 nautical miles east of New Jersey. And I'll, I'll, I'll introduce the, the companies and provide a quick background on them. Uh, RWE and National Grid Ventures are two companies with one mission to build strong, sustainable communities for the future. Both of these companies are highly innovative uh, by reputation. RWE is one of the world's leading renewable energy companies. It's the second largest offshore wind developer in the world. Um, we're a global leader in innovation. Right now, we're testing the world's first recyclable turbine blade on a project in the North Sea that's in that photo to the right there. Um, we're also piloting vibratory pile driving technology and piloting green hydrogen projects and floating offshore wind energy technologies. The company is committed to 50 gigawatts of green power generation by 2030 and has made the capital commitments to back that up. Uh, we've built over 20 offshore wind projects to date around the world with 20 with offshore, I'm sorry, with renewable energy projects in over 25 different countries. National Grid Ventures is a com competitive division of National Grid with local and international expertise in developing large scale infrastructure and clean energy technologies. They specialize significantly in transmission and, in, and they have subsea electricity connect interconnectors, wind and solar power and battery storage. Recent innovations on Long Island, New York include development of two battery energy storage systems and a green hydrogen pilot program. And before I turn to Deirdre and get out of her way, um, I just wanna say what a privilege it is. Um, and I know this won't come as any, any surprise to to you around the table or, or members who know them, but to be in a position now to be working with Michelle Duval and Deirdre Bulky on this project. Um, Michelle and I had the pleasure of working together through the council process when she chaired the South Atlantic Council and working through the CCC. Um, and I, I was able to serve on the scallop committee for nine years and got to work with Deirdre while she was plan coordinator there. So um, we're just really uh, in a very fortunate position, I think, to have their expertise and fisheries experience on our team. Uh, as a team, I can tell you we're very excited about the cooperative research opportunities that we uh, expect to come, come along with this project and its future developments. Um, we're committed to achieving successful outcomes for both the project and the fisheries, and uh, look forward to engaging with the council as we get through this process. So, Deirdre. Thank you, Rick. I know it's hard to hear in the back. Hopefully this is okay. It's great to see everyone. Good morning. My name is Deirdre Bolke, as, as Rick said, and before joining RWE earlier this summer, I was a staffer with the New England Fishery Management Council for over 20 years, had the opportunity to work with many of you, so it, it feels good to be back here. I'm glad it didn't take too long to sit at this seat again and, and present to a council. 
So excited to be here. And as Rick mentioned, I, I am gonna be one of the fishery liaisons for this particular project, along with Michelle Duval that you all know, who sits with you representing Pennsylvania on the Mid-Atlantic Council. And, and finally, over on the right-hand side, we have Rick Robbins, our Marine Affairs Manager. And I think, you know, you know Rick's, Rick's past very well, familiar face to this table and his background in seafood processing and international marketing will we'll fully round out our you know, relatively large team. We are still growing. We, we hopefully by the end of the summer, we'll have additional fishery liaison uh, representatives in the fishing industry, helping us uh, you know, more folks on the ground as we prepare into our surveys and so forth. But our experience you can see from this slide is definitely heavy in fisheries management at both the state and federal level. We have all worked in, in different fisheries, faced a lot of challenging issues uh, in fisheries management and, and collaborating with folks to, to solve these difficult uh, issues that, that you all face. So we are, we're committed to a lot of the same principles that the council you know, is at your core in terms of communication, collaboration, and transparency. So all of those terms are things we take very seriously and plan to use you know, to help guide our work uh, on this project. So just to take one slide as a quick snapshot of the fishery participants and stakeholders as we know them right now for this particular lease area, a critical first step is definitely having a very comprehensive understanding of the current and historical uses within the lease space, as well as the cable corridors that we potentially would, would tap into on shore. Based on the information that the regional office has shared with our team, we, we know that the, the two Primary fisheries are surf clams and sea scallops. So those will obviously be where we'll be focusing. Most of the revenue that has come out of this area has been in those two very important high revenue fisheries for this entire East Coast, really. So we are actively engaging with, with those two fisheries already, but we also know there are a handful of other more seasonal fisheries that, that do occur from time to time and in different parts of the year within the lease area. There's a little bit of um, seasonal gill netting for monkfish and uh, some, some trawling for summer flounder and black sea bass pots, you know, near or within parts of the lease area. Recreational fisheries is definitely also something that we will be focusing on. There's private anglers, for hire anglers for a variety of different species, definitely some transiting going on through the area, getting to very important, you know, prime uh, recreational fishing locations near the lease area. So in addition to the commercial and recreational fisheries that we will be engaging with, with heavily, we also know there are other stakeholders in this ocean space that we will be engaging with, whale watching companies, and as the cables come into shore, working with different groups in terms of uh, recreation along the coast, kayaking, sailing, scuba, et cetera. So we definitely will be taking a very holistic approach in this engagement and, and working with communities uh, really throughout the region. So before we share some of our ideas about communication and engagement, we just wanted to focus and, and share this slide. Uh, this is getting at some fishery mitigation information that was you just kind of heard through from the BOEM presentation this morning. And we definitely wanted to build on and share our philosophy about fisheries mitigation and what we've been talking about so far. Mitigation is a very broad term, as you heard earlier this morning, and includes a lot of different approaches. And our team is definitely focusing on avoidance first at the bottom of this pyramid. You know, this is a hierarchy of all kinds of mitigation. Definitely proactive approaches to avoiding impacts is, is a top priority. When those cannot be fully avoided, we'd then be sliding into the minimization, rectifying, reducing, and then finally, as a last resort, any compensation for things that could not be fully addressed you know, earlier. So this is our approach. We are, you know, this is not unique. You know, this is how fisheries management and environmental impact approaches are, are used for successful outcomes. So this will be guiding us as we continue to develop Again, not just the financial compensation at all, but all those other steps leading up to that in a very holistic way. We have started brainstorming a lot of ideas. We're starting to have those discussions with folks and are very excited to kind of hit all the different subjects, not just for the fishing vessels, but for the communities uh, beyond that, 
the environment and ecosystem itself. So we are really excited about, you know, just looking at all these things across across the board. So just one thing, one of the first deliverables you could say that our team will be working on and, and we have been all summer is a draft fisheries communication plan. You have heard about this probably uh, in some of the BOEM requirements for a project. And the, the bubbles on the screen are really just highlighting the, the core things that we're focusing on with this communications plan. Uh, our team is very committed to a successful project, a project that is uh, fishable to the, the, the greatest extent. Uh, we plan to build on a lot of relationships we already have within the fishing industry, elevating and leveraging those to things you know, beyond talking about just the project itself and the design, but in all aspects of, of the project, even on shore. Rick mentioned innovation. This is definitely a focus of our, of our communication plan as well and figuring out the best ways to communicate and work with different groups of stakeholders. So we, we have a lot of objectives with this plan. We have words on paper. We are, are really close to you know, sharing that. And, and you know, today, we're even hoping to highlight on a few of those things and get some initial feedback from people at the table as well as in the hallway uh, of just the different strategies that, that we have in mind. So I just have one or two slides to give you a sense of that. Uh, on the left-hand side is kind of a flow chart of all the different nodes. We're describing them here, and these really are, are stakeholder types and groups. We recognize people don't belong in just one or the other. In many cases, they're, they're linked. So we have plans very specific for each fishery of how we plan to engage uh, with different groups and, and how they're interconnected to each other. There's a column on the right-hand side of this slide that highlights a few examples of the ways we hope to communicate with people in the coming months and years. And this is flexible. We, we have an initial plan and we definitely wanna vet that with, with folks and adjust it if there are better ways to do it. So we have definitely a lot of individual and small group meetings planned. We hope to organize uh, some larger workshops hopefully with other developers and agencies that are, could be you know, specific to a different topic that a lot of people are facing. So you know, there's, there's a long different list of ways to engage and, and get feedback. And so we're gonna, we're gonna try them all and, and see what works best and, and adjust as we go. So what's next, as I mentioned, our team will be um, over the next few months you may be aware that the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority, or NYSERDA, has recently published a request for proposals uh, seeking applications. So we are actively reviewing that. Proposals are due you know, before the end of the year. And uh, in addition to, to kind of reviewing that and taking that into consideration, we will be very focused on continuing this idea of proactive mitigation. Uh, this is something we've started already. This is a photo here on the right of, of some engineers that we have on our team from Community Offshore Wind meeting with fisheries in New Jersey, you know, looking at the gear, feeling it, touching it, understanding how it works, um, really just starting that dialogue, building trust, and hopefully identifying ways to, to build the most successful farm that, that would maintain, maintain access for these important fisheries. So we're definitely working on that. This is you know, we will be doing this throughout, um, starting early. The, set, the third bullet here, uh, strong collaboration and communication. You know, we are coming from the fisheries management realm. All, all three of us have been in this space for, for many years. So we are hoping to just continue building that trust, keeping those conversations going and, and identifying ways to, to really make this a successful project. In terms of the communication plan itself, uh, today, if, if there's time or interest, or maybe you can catch us later, the things that we've shared about our initial ideas for output, we are definitely cognizant of efficiency and trying to work with other developers and in efficient ways. We understand there's a lot of burnout already on these topics, um, but there, there is a lot to talk about. It was really nice to hear a lot of the comments before the, the previous presentation. Um, 
you know, that was, that was really helpful to hear and, and for us to hear those, those thoughts. And this is not easy. And I think we all recognize this is not going to be easy, but our careers have been very focused on collaborating with people, sol solving these hard problems, and we're very committed to that. So that's what we'll be working on um, for, for a while here. So here's our contact information. Hopefully you can visit our website when you have time. There's some information on there. Our team is, is growing all the time. And you know, definitely please reach out. This is a photo of us um, in Howard Beach. That we had a beach cleanup with, with some of our team there uh, about a month or so ago. And hopefully we got through that not too quickly, reserved a little bit of time for questions and discussion or any thoughts you have. But, but please reach out, we'd love to talk to you. Excellent. Um, it's nice to see both of you, and thanks for being here uh, and providing us your presentation for today. Does anyone around the table have any questions or comments or thoughts they want to ask of Rick or Deidre? Go ahead, Lieutenant Commander. Hi, good morning, and uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, I was interested in uh, kind of hearing how um, plan to deconflict uh, some of the some of the, uh, the survey uh, vessel movements as you progress on into the project. Um, over the past year, we've had to uh, we've been in a response role uh, to mitigate some of the on water disputes um, from other some of the other wind projects. So, just kind of curious to see um, as you get more into the development of the uh, survey vessel process, um, how you kind of plan to go about trying to mitigate some of those dis you know, potential disputes on the water. Yeah, so <clears throat> I appreciate the question. And uh, we're, we're, right now we're uh, finalizing our, our survey plans. Um, and, and, and those will include communication plans to go along with them. So uh, it, well in advance of actually starting at sea survey work, we'll issue a notice to mariners. Um, but we'll also uh, develop specific communication materials for the fishing industry. Um, we'll make those available. And, and Deirdre touched on uh, some other other strategies for communicating with the fishing industry that we'll, we'll rely on. But uh, some of those are digital. We think there, there are probably going to be some technological advances here um, probably in the fourth quarter of this year that would allow us to uh, really efficiently communicate with the fishing fleet uh, with respect to those uh, at-sea activities. So, uh, you know, I, I think we'll have, have, a, have a very positive development on that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else from the council? Yeah, I don't see any hands from council members. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and provide an opportunity for the public. And we have an old friend, uh, Tony Delernia, online. Go ahead, Tony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's uh, good to be with you. I wish I could have been there with you in person today, but NYSERDA has some other plans for me for this afternoon, so I had to stay up here in New York. Uh, Deirdre, can I ask you to put slide number eight up on the screen for me, please? Here we go. Yeah, your strategies. I just, uh, I was trying to get a screenshot of them before. I think you have some very good ideas here. I was trying to get a screenshot, but uh, before uh, I was able to take it, uh, you had switched slides. So uh, I appreciate this. I think it's a good idea. It's a good organization. It's good uh, uh, having been doing uh, outreach a couple of years myself. Uh, I think you have a nice plan here. Uh, will these slides be available also, Mr. Chairman? Can I uh, download these later? Are they part of the briefing materials at this point? Can someone answer that question for me? Yeah, they're, we'll, we'll make them accessible. I, I believe they already are, but if not, we'll, we'll make sure they go online, Tony. That sounds great. Okay, thank you very much. That's all I had. And uh, again, I wish I had been there with you. Hello to everyone, and uh, perhaps the next council meeting. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, Tony. Rick? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to re reiterate that Deirdre and I will be here uh, throughout the day and overnight um, tonight. And if, if you all would like to catch up with us and bend our ears and uh, just tell us, tell us uh, you know, things that you've experienced with other communication plans or uh, concerns or recommendations you might have at this early stage in the process, we'd, we'd really welcome that. So uh, look forward to continued discussion. Thank you. Thank you all very much for your time this morning. Yeah, thanks for being here with us. Um, I don't have any other hands raised at this time. So thanks again, uh, Rick and Deirdre, for being here and um, look forward to talking with you later today and into this evening. Uh, with that, we're going to take a break at this point. Uh, we'll come back at 11 o'clock and pick up 
our um, our agenda from there. Thank you. See you at eleven.
Okay, this is everybody's uh, two minute warning. We're gonna get started again in a couple minutes. You can start to take your seats, thank you. Okay, everyone, welcome back from break. Um, the next item on our agenda this morning is a presentation uh, from Kylie Dancy with council staff on the East Coast climate change scenario planning exercise that's been ongoing. Uh, Kylie is, um, she's participating virtually with us today. And Kylie, we have a few folks kind of coming back from the break at this point, but I think it's appropriate to go ahead and get started whenever you're ready. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, you're a little faint, but we'll we'll work on increasing the volume. Go ahead and start, and we'll we'll play with the uh, with the audio. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm going to provide a, a brief update on the climate change scenario planning initiative. Uh, we've been working pretty hard in in recent days to finalize some of the products from the scenario creation workshop. And some of those have just finished um, in the last couple of days. So I apologize for those not being available sooner and uh, not being able to go into as much depth on some of them in this presentation. But I think this will be an overview of kind of the recent steps and the next steps that we're taking for this initiative. So just a reminder of the, the initiative objectives for scenario planning is to explore how East Coast fishery governance and management issues will be affected by climate driven change in fisheries, particularly changing stock availability and distributions. And second, to advance a set of tools and processes that provide flexible and robust fishery management strategies, which continue to promote fishery conservation and resilient fishing communities and address uncertainty in an era of climate change. So you've seen a version of this timeline uh, and the steps a couple times. So from the fall of 2020 through the winter of 2022, we conducted the first three phases of this initiative, which the council has previously discussed. And now we are wrapping up the scenario creation phase, which included a scenario creation workshop held in June. And we'll also include a couple of webinar sessions later this month to further refine the details of the draft scenarios that were developed at the workshop. And so soon, sorry, soon we'll start the application phase of the project where we will focus on discussing how uh, management and governance should adapt to be prepared for multiple possible future scenarios. So to talk just a, briefly a little bit more about the scenario creation workshop and its outputs, we held a scenario creation workshop June 21st to 23rd in Arlington, Virginia. The workshop was attended by about 75 people, including uh, stakeholders and, and core team members. We had a really productive two and a half day meeting and we found that, you know, the core team was really happy with the participants being really engaged and energetic about the process. And we think it was a really productive meeting. There is a workshop summary document that was recently posted to the meeting materials, which has uh, some more details about how the workshop was conducted and what that process was like. The figure here hits some of the highlights of the process. The structure had us basically starting out reviewing drivers of change that we had discussed in previous phases of the initiative. And we had then had small groups create and describe a series of quick um, mini scenarios using a bunch of different combinations of future possible future conditions and, and factors of change. And then we kind of took a look across all of these different rapid fire scenarios and we could start to see patterns and themes emerging 
to focus in on and create a draft scenario framework. And once we had that framework, we went back to the small groups to really develop the draft scenarios in each area of the framework. So um, I will cover next sort of an overview of those draft scenarios that were ultimately developed and that are posted to the meeting materials now in a draft scenario narratives document. Um, but I do want to note that between the workshop and now the scenarios have been condensed a bit into four scenarios rather than if some of you were at the workshop, you, you might remember that there were eight um, scenarios that were developed there at the workshop. So at the end of the workshop, we discussed, you know, participants were aware that the core team would be looking at those and refining those a bit and, and condensing them because ultimately we felt like looking at the eight um, was a really useful exercise, but it was resulted in kind of too many scenarios to be effective for the applications phase. So in the interest of time, I'm kind of just going to talk about the framework that we ended up with ultimately with the four scenarios that we have now. But if you want to look back in the workshop report, there's more uh, details about kind of how that came about with the eight original scenarios. So the framework that we have ultimately in our draft scenarios document is constructed in a, in a two by two matrix format that I believe this council, you've seen examples of that before when we've previously discussed this, but it's done by combining two different critical uncertainties or important factors that are likely to shape the future, but could develop in unpredictable ways. The first factor used in our framework is what happens to stock productivity and um, you know, species production due to climate change. On the one end, we might see mostly declining productivity along with kind of worsening habitat and low rates of species replacement. And on the other end, we might see productivity mostly maintained or even increasing with adequate habitat and species replacement. So this axis is really about the health of fish stocks and habitat overall. The second axis that we used is about the predictability of ocean conditions and how well the science is able to keep up with predicting and assessing stock status and distribution. So on the one end, we have conditions and changes that become really unpredictable with existing science sort of struggling to provide much useful information on relevant timescales, it becomes hard to predict how stocks are doing and where they're going. Um, on the other end, we have conditions and changes that might be more predictable and science is sufficiently able to predict uh, conditions and provide useful advice. When you intersect these ax axes, you have four resulting quad quadrants with each kind of representing a different scenario. And so just to remind you what each scenario is intended to be, they're not predictions, but they're meant to be stories that outline what might happen with these different factors um, varying on the two axes. So they contain storylines and suggestions about how fishing industry participants and managers and other players might adapt and, and react to and prepare for such conditions. So what we ended up with is, you know, in the top left quadrant, we have a situation where stock productivity is maintained, but they are difficult to assess and locate. Good productivity, but less good science. On the top right, we have uh, similarly high productivity of stocks, but science does keep up, changes are more predictable. We have a good ability to assess and predict changes. On the bottom right, stocks are generally declining, but we ha still have that ability to have the good science where we can assess and predict change as well. And finally, on the bottom left, this is kind of the, the worst situation all around with lower stock productivity and a low ability to assess and predict um, stock changes. So this is the framework that was discussed at the workshop with the main difference being that at the workshop, we actually had a third sort of uh, axes within each of these quadrants related to adaptability, so high and low adaptability of the industry and management. And so what we did with that as the core team following the workshop was to kind of pull out the themes of adaptability and the high and low adaptability spectrum from each of these and address that as sort of a separate but really important element of all of these scenarios. And you can see that and, and read more about that in the documents that are posted to the meeting materials. So the core team has further refined each of these quadrants, um, but primarily based on ideas and themes and conversations that were had by the breakout groups at the workshop. So we looked back through all of our notes and everything that was written down on worksheets and developed some draft scenario narratives that are available in the briefing materials. And we gave each scenario a draft name. 
So it's hard to summarize each of these stories completely in a figure. So there are a lot more details in those narratives, but you know, basically what workshop participants thought would, would might happen in each scenario, um, a quick summary of each is that the, the top left would be potentially a situation of ocean pioneers where you would have a wild west of new ocean users and risk taking fishery operators that are taking advantage that some are able to take advantage of confusing and um, unpredictable, but ultimately positive uh, stock conditions. And then checks and balances in the top right, where we have strong science combined with collaborative management to help mitigate and adapt to climate driven changes in the ocean. Um, bottom right, you see seafood lemonade, a world where we have good science, but the news is bad. And so success there comes from anticipating lower stocks and preparing for new catch limits and, and adapting to that uh, future of low stock productivity, but good science. Um, the bottom left is stress fractures, a world with multiple sources of stress facing operators and managers, where the industry fractures between some who play it smart and others who lose out. So this is sort of a brief summary of these narratives. And again, we sort of just finalized these um, narratives this week. So we definitely plan to um, get into more details of these during the next step of the process, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But the purpose of these scenarios is, is basically to act as a platform for conversations about preparing for climate change. We Our next step is a set of two scenario deepening webinars, and those are intended to ensure that these stories are as as useful as possible to serve as as a platform for the conversations that we need to have about management and governance changes. So these scenarios are definitely not final, and we will be talking more about these in the um, scenario deepening webinars, which I would encourage council members to listen into, participate in. If you are interested, we have two um, two hour webinars that we plan to hold on Wednesday, August seventeenth, and Tuesday, August twenty third. And we will be um, the registration information for those is available on the calendar events on our website, as well as on the scenario planning page on our website. So um, these webinars, again, we we will have um, an opportunity for all interested stakeholders to sort of review and validate and add details to those scenarios and just to comment on on whether they make sense to to folks. So the, the step after that is we sort of enter the applications phase and what we plan to do with that, we do have a new um, kind of step that, that we've added to have a series of manager brainstorming working group conversations. We had originally intended to do, um, go to the fall council and commission meetings for each management body and discuss recommendations, but we have pushed that back a bit to November and December. Um, we were concerned about not having kind of ideas to feed into those discussions that would lead to really productive council and commission discussions. And we wanted to add this phase of brainstorming working groups with the purpose of having a kind of cross caucus, cross region, small group webinar discussions of managers to identify issues and ideas and options that should be discussed at each of the council and commission meetings, as well as at the summit meeting. So this is sort of um, take, transitioning us into the applications phase where we would have uh, leadership from each council and the commission identify a couple participants to brainstorm how we might adopt to the, each of these scenarios, what ideas need to be considered uh, in terms of changes to management and governance. And then again, we'll have another conversation about this as the full council in December for, for our council. And we do have a summit meeting that is tentatively scheduled for early 2023. And that would be something that wouldn't be the full councils from each from each region, but it would be a subset of each group would come to the summit meeting and discuss the input from each of the previous steps and have the goal of developing a final set of governance and management and monitoring recommendations from the scenario planning process. So then once we kind of have that, that final report and that final set of recommendations, uh, we do recognize that most of those recommendations are probably going to require further development and discussions. We will have to act on them uh, following that. So it's not necessarily the end of the process, but we do expect sort of a final report and a final set of recommendations from this initiative to be generated following that summit meeting. 
and that would be intended to be an in-person meeting and targeting um, you know, maybe 50 to 60 participants. We don't have any uh, details yet about uh, dates and location for that, but those are our, our next steps. And again, would encourage you all to listen into these scenario deepening webinars where we'll be going into a little bit more detail on the draft scenarios. And that is all I have for the, for the update on scenario planning. Happy to take any questions. Yeah, thanks, Kylie. Let me look to see if anyone from the council has any comments or questions for Kylie at this time. Adam Nowalski. Great, so I apologize to all of everybody around the table. My commenting here is probably gonna cost you all another break. Um, so uh, the uh, idea of the stock productivity uh, with mostly maintained uh, versus declining. Uh, what discussion not having attended the workshops myself might have been had around having that arrow uh, instead of going to mostly maintained increasing productivity. I think we've seen that with a species like black sea bass where clearly that is a stock that has increased in productivity in recent years, higher recruitment, something's going on that the environment is very conducive for that stock. So I'd love to hear a little bit about why we're just looking at mostly maintained versus the opposite of mostly declining, which to me would be an increasing productivity. Thanks, Adam. Kylie? Yeah, I, I think there is certainly room for, for increasing productivity there. I think the, the sense was that, you know, we know climate change is going to impact a lot of the species and for you know, for many species, we're kind of unsure what warming water and, and other changes are, are necessarily going to do. We wouldn't expect necessarily increased productivity from across the board, but I think that there's certainly, maybe this is just the shorthand of the slide where it says, you know, mostly maintained, I think is intended to be maintained or increasing for some stocks. Uh, you know, I think, um, I, you know, I'd have to go back to the core team on this, and I think this is something that we can definitely talk about more in the scenario deepening process, and this is the kind of feedback that we want. But I think maybe the sense was that we wouldn't necessarily expect to see um, a huge overall increase in in productivity across many stocks. And perhaps there's others on the core team that that can answer that better than I than I could. Okay, thanks, Kylie. Anyone else from the council at this time? Okay, seeing none at this time, is there anyone from the audience that has a question or a comment? Bonnie Brady? Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. Um, I was one of the participants at the uh, event, wherever we were. I can't even remember. Was it Baltimore? No, it was Alexandria, I think. Um, Adam, I remember talking about the two components specifically, but that seemed to have gotten watered down. Um, I'm looking at the report, Kylie, uh, that w is on the website. Uh, Let's see, I'm, I'm at page 12 here, for those of you that are playing along at home. The East Coast Climate Scenario Planning. Kylie, there seems to be a real disconnect from what our group created and what was the decision making for the, this, this view. Our uh, group, all of the comments under making lemonade, which was high adaptability, were prefaced on the concept that offshore wind was going to displace a great deal of fishing from the entire area. So the fishing requires a lot of external support was because people were gonna be put out of business. The, they added in the Ukrainian war just for kicks. Uh, US supports the development of domestic markets. That too was because of the fact that fishing would be affected so dramatically. Uh, better use of underutilized species, kelp farms, aquaculture expansion, federal funds pay for radar, electric vessels, compensate fishermen for lost wages from offshore wind displacement. That was key and vital to that scenario, which filtered up 
it was basically on day one, and I'm not saying this about, it was, it was a done nice project, the guy in charge and everybody was great, but I was sitting at a table where it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, pretty much where six people just every time I discussed anything about what is the biggest elephant in the room, just ignored it. And in order to get it put on the table, I had to do a lot of explaining, a lot of information in order to even have it adjusted. So then we got the doomsday scenario, which is on a back page 51, and we chewed it down into this. But on day two, our note taker was actually offering comments at the event, which was a problem. And now looking at this report, seeing no mention, it's only looking at climate change when in fact, the reason that we were discussing offshore wind is because the wind wake effect can mimic climate change. And with the build out that they're talking about in the US, that was the number one concern. And that most of the answers that came out of making lemonade were due to, to the condition that isn't listed there. So that's a real problem. And I really hope that gets corrected. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that comment, Bonnie. I'll turn to Kylie. Kylie, is there any, do you have any response? Um, yeah, so I wasn't, you know, part of that group or that quadrant. And so I, I can't necessarily speak to the specifics, but we can go back to the notes that were taken for that one. And we can have a conversation offline about that, um, Bonnie, and, what, and what's reflected here. You know, I will note in the workshop summary, these tables with the elements of each scenario are a little bit condensed from, you know, the full notes of each of, each of the groups. Um, but yeah, we can certainly go back and take a look at the notes and, and perhaps um, enhance that if needed. Okay, thanks for that, Kylie. Um, we appreciate your updates and we'll look forward to the upcoming webinars. Uh, hopefully council members and, and folks that are interested will be able to participate and listen into those webinars. So thanks again for your time this morning, Kylie. Uh, we're gonna move on to the next item on our agenda, which is the Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee report. And I'm gonna turn things over to Kate Wilkie, who's our Ecosystems and Ocean Planning Committee Chair for that report, Kate. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Kylie's gonna start us off with the slides and then I'll pick it up in the middle. Okay, excellent. It's all you, Kylie. All right, so I just have a couple introductory slides to just give some context on the Hudson Can potential designation of Hudson Canyon. Um, and so first, just being that the area of Hudson Canyon was nominated as a potential sanctuary in 2016 by the Wildlife Conservation Society and at that time, um, in 2017, it was added to the inventory of possible national marine sanctuaries and uh, has remained on that inventory since that time. And so then in June of this year, the NOAA Office of Na National Marine Sanctuaries announced that the initiation of a scoping process to consider the designation of Hudson Canyon as a national marine sanctuary. So before it was just on an inventory of possible areas and this um, June 8th Federal Register notice kind of kicked off the designation process, which is a lengthy separate process for potentially designating the area as a sanctuary. So just a, a quick note that there are no official boundaries currently proposed by NOAA. Um, the figure that's shown in the slide is from a presentation from WCS in 2017 showing the boundary that they had in their nomination and uh, that was proposed kind of just as a starting point for discussion, but it also shows the overlap with the Mid-Atlantic Council's discrete coral zone for Hudson Canyon. So this is to give you an idea of the general area that, that is under consideration for a sanctuary. So a little bit of context about fishing in National Marine Sanctuaries before we get into the committee and AP comments. Um, just noting quickly that sanctuary designation would not necessarily result in new fishing restrictions. So how this works is sanctuaries don't have the authority to establish fishing regulations unless fishing is specifically listed as an activity that can be regulated within the terms of designation. And that is in 
um, all of the de designation documents that get developed throughout the, the lengthy designation process. So that is kind of not officially uh, determined until the designation documents are final uh, toward the end of the process. But um, most sanctuaries currently in existence don't have fishing within the terms of designation, meaning that fishing is not an activity that's subject to separate sanctuary regulations. And that's um, that's it for the sort of intro comments, I think, and I'll pass it over to Kate for the committee and AP comments. Okay, thanks, Kylie. Next slide, please. The Ecosystem and Ocean Planning Committee met jointly with the advisory panel on July 21st, and the purpose was to provide input to inform scoping comments on potential designation of Hudson Canyon National Marine Sanctuary. Next slide. Uh, staff hasn't had time to compile a meeting summary yet, but I'll go through an overview of the comments from the committee and the AP. And the reason that there wasn't time for a meeting summary is they were busy working on the comment letter, which was due this past Monday. So there were mixed perspectives on designation from committee and AP members. Ultimately, participants agreed that the council support for sanctuary designation should be contingent on the councils and NIMS retaining fisheries management authority in the area. There, were, there was general agreement that prohibitions on oil and gas and drilling and exploration would be a positive. Uh, and there were a lot of questions on the permissibility of wind. Next slide. So some of the fishery management concerns that were expressed during the committee and AP meeting was concern about retaining fisheries management authority. Uh, the WCS nomination supports continued fishing within the sanctuary, but one AP member noted concerning language in the nomination regarding the impacts of trawl fishing. Fishing being excluded from the list of regulated activities is not guaranteed until the documents are final. So it could possibly change in the future, although that would require a long public comment process to change any of the rules within the sanctuary. Uh, next slide. Some other concerns that were discussed at the meeting were that fisheries are already sustainably managed by the councils and several participants cited examples. For example, several fisheries are now MSC certified uh, the council has designated the coral protection areas. Um, and so therefore folks were unsure of the benefit or the need for designation. Also, we heard comments about too much is at stake for fisheries and the ocean is al already getting smaller for operators. Next slide. We also talked about sanctuary boundaries. And as Kylie just mentioned, no specific boundaries have been proposed at this time. Two AP members suggested support for current Mid-Atlantic Council discrete zone uh, coral protection area as a boundary if the designation moves forward. Uh, and also it was brought up that a process could be used to determine the coral protection areas uh, that, that would be modeled, at, sorry. <laughs> Um, they could use the process to determine the coral protection areas um, to determine sanctuary boundaries. Next slide. We also talked about what can we learn from other sanctuaries. The council should seek clarification on how fisheries are managed in other sanctuaries uh, and, and look up to lessons learned from other sanctuaries, in particular the Stell Wagon Bank case and the question was brought up are there are there cases where fishing was allowed and then later removed from a sanctuary next slide we talked about the potential benefits of sanctuary designation which would include exclusion of oil and gas exploration and mining and then there were a lot of questions about uh, whether or not wind would be permitted. And I have another slide later on that. Uh, another benefit would be increased education and public awareness of the area and its resources, including council efforts, potential resources for research and monitoring. 
And then we talked about how additional clarity on the benefits of a sanctuary would be helpful for future council discussion. Next slide. Relating to offshore wind, uh, the committee and AP wanted more clarity on the potential for wind energy permitting in marine sanctuaries. Boehm asserts that they do not have the authority to permit wind in sanctuaries, and there's some confusion regarding whether permitting would be possible via other agencies. And there's some ongoing policy and legal conversations happening. Clarity on this issue is needed to inform future comments and, and discussions. Next slide. So some other points that were discussed were that the council should consider sanctuary goals and whether or how they align with council goals. There's a need to clarify other mechanisms for protecting important areas from offshore oil and gas development, if, if not via sanctuary designation. And the CCC area-based management report would be informative for council consideration of this issue. So those were just some of the other points brought up by the committee and the AP. Next slide. Also, we talked about uh, support for formation of a pre-designation sanctuary advisory council. The council should highlight the economic value of fisheries harvested in the proposed sanctuary, including tonnage, and also the importance to small businesses, communities, and including recreational fisheries. And it may be more constructive to participate in the design of sanctuary of the sanctuary versus just opposing it. Um, so those are some of the other points that were brought up. Next slide, please. So based on the discussion that was had at the meeting, staff went back and drafted a scoping comment letter that was then reviewed by the full council via email. And that letter was submitted just uh, this past Monday on August 8th, which was the deadline for the letter. You can access the letter at the link below. And it was brought up by the committee and the AP that, um, that they were interested in having an action page on the Mid-Atlantic Council website for this issue. So Mary created that and it can be found at the link below. Next slide. So now I'll turn it back over to Kylie for a few next next steps and about the designation process. All right, I just have a couple of very brief um, next steps to highlight here. So this is the um, graphic from the sanctuary program about the nomination process. And again, it's a lengthy process that's highly participatory. So it, you know, in many ways, it's not unlike our process for developing a council FMP or amendment. So the first step is scoping, which was just uh, concluded. And so NOAA announced its intent to, to designate a sanctuary and asked for input on specific aspects of that. And um, following the scoping process, there is the development of a sanctuary proposal. So this is a fairly involved steps that includes preparing different documents, a uh, draft document uh, management plan, a draft environmental impact statement, a range of alternatives and proposed regulations and proposed boundaries. So um, that could also include the formation of a sanctuary advisory council to help inform the proposal and focus stakeholder participation. Uh, next, there's a public review step where the public, um, agency partners, tribes, and other stakeholders provide input on the draft documents. And then finally, a final decision is made, including the final designation documents. Um, I also just wanted to cover that separately from scoping, the council is going to have the opportunity to directly consult with the Office of Marine Sanctuaries on fishing regulations during the designation process. So under the National Marine Sanctuaries Act, councils have the opportunity to prepare draft regulations for fishing or to recommend that fishing regulations are not necessary. And so this is referring specifically to additional fishing regulations that would be specifically within the sanctuary under the Sanctuaries Act and the sanctuary regulations. So again, if um, the council could, could choose to prepare draft regulations if uh, deemed necessary 
or uh, this council could recommend that additional fishing regulations are not necessary. So we, we received a letter requesting this input and the other East Coast councils also um, received the same request. And we've been asked to provide a response by December 31st. So the council will have the opportunity to discuss that issue between now and, and then. So I think that is all I have for the next step. So um, back to you, Kate. Okay, thanks, Kylie. And uh, before I turn for questions, I just want to thank Kate and the members of the committee for the work that went into providing comment for scoping as well as the advisory panel. I had the opportunity to listen in to most of that meeting. I was pulled away from my desk a few times, but um, there was a lot of discussion and I thought that staff um, was able to, you know, take that information and turn it into a really well-informed letter. So thanks, Kate, for uh, for working with the AP and the committee members on, on that. Um, so we're at the point uh, we've moved beyond the scoping, and Kylie just mentioned that this is not the let council's last opportunity uh, to be a part of this discussion. And so with what was presented today, I thought we'd open up the floor for any questions or any additional comments um, at this time. I have uh, Peter Hughes and then Sonny. Go ahead, Peter. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for your report today, Kylie. Um, one of your slides, one of your very initial slides is general area under consideration and you have no boundary currently proposed by NOAA. The figure below is from the 2017 WCS presentation. So with no boundaries identified, um, you know, it's really kind of hard for us to uh, quantify and, and um, you know, really zero in on some comments about the boundaries with no, no boundaries identified. But I will note um, to Council that in a previous presentation, uh, and, and it could have been slides that I was looking at in different things, because I've looked at a lot of different slides here this morning, um, there is a wind energy area, you know, that, that kind of abuts this, this area from 2017 on the southern portion and on the northern portion. Um, and, and I should, should we incorporate some sort of comments um, in that identifying that, that those are already going to be de facto areas that are closed to commercial fishing, although they say they're not closed, they're pretty much going to be closed. So just wondering if that should uh, be, be part of um, the comments. Thank you. Kylie, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so my understanding is that that is part of the reason why NOAA didn't propose a specific boundary was um, there was, I think, from this 2016 WCS proposal, there was a slight overlap with a, a wind energy area that I believe was unintentional. And so I think that is part of the reason why um, NOAA did not propose specific boundaries, but I don't think that that was, there was meant to be overlap there. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that, Peter. Thanks, Kylie. Sonny Gwynn. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. One of the questions I had is on one of the bullets you had, uh, the governor makes the decision. Did I read that right? What governor makes the decision? So it goes to the governor or to Congress? Yeah, so that was from the, um, there's a figure, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, a figure on the um, sanctuary's website that does refer to the governor. And, and I did clarify with sanctuary staff that I think that is for sanctuaries that are fully or partly in state waters, that the, re the relevant governors would have the opportunity to review the documents. And in this case, it would be um, Congress. Yeah, we're we are having a little bit of a hard time hearing, but I think the uh, the, the brain trust to my left over here got it all worked out. Uh, so Sonny, I think is informed at this point. So thanks, Kylie. Appreciate that. Um, let's see who we have. Michelle Duvall. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. And again, huge kudos to staff for a letter that was well put together and I think really did a great job of capturing the committee and advisory panel comments and, and you know, sewing all of those together. And so for our next steps, we'll be um, considering the, the specific request that for which the deadline is December for any specific regulations and maybe just a question for Chairman Reed, because I know that the New England Council had also submitted um, comments in response to the, the scoping, the request for input on scoping back in, I think, March. And will the New England Council also be planning to offer comments for those, that specific consultation on regulations as well? Yeah, the, well, the deadline is December 31st, and uh, there may be a request to extend Council ability to comment beyond that. Uh, as far as New England goes, we have our meeting in sep end of September. The agenda is extremely busy and so is the one in December. So you might we might offer a suggestion that council com uh, comment timeline is extended from December 31st, but I I'm not I'm not exactly sure if that is going to go over or not. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no other hands from any members of the council, I'll go out to the public for a quick comment or two. I have James Fletcher up first. Go ahead, James. I would suggest that the commercial industry has all the hangs on the East Coast and a number of different formats. If you take those hangs and figure a quarter of a mile around them or less that the boats avoid, it becomes a tremendous amount of bottom that is not covered by the trawl. And if you would go to NOAA, the surveys, there are certain areas that they avoid because of entanglement with hangs. Those two sets of information would show you that we already have over 50% of the bottom that is not trawled. And I don't think it's a problem with the people using hook and line. So my question is, why don't we use the best available science that shows what's already closed? And on this map, you don't show the areas closed for coral and everything else when we come in, why don't we show all the areas that are currently closed or managed? It's disheartening to continue to have to defend when we're in an ever shrinking area that the commercial industry can work in. Thank you for your time. Thank you, James. Appreciate the comment. Okay, seeing no one else, is, let me ask the audience here in the room, is there anybody that wants to make any comment at this time? All right, seeing no hands, um, we're going to go ahead and move on. But Kate, thank you again for the work that your committee put into the scoping comments. And Kylie, thank you for the time spent uh, in um, creating a very well-informed document um, to go forward. And we'll look forward to uh, continuing this discussion uh, prior to the December 31st timeline, which uh, Chairman Reed said may be a request for extension uh, based on other council priorities uh, leading up to the end of this year. So we'll just stay in touch on that. And um, that concludes that item on the agenda. So we're going to move into our last item of the agenda for this morning. And we're, uh, we have Jason Didden and Peter Hughes here to provide us an update on New England Fishery Management Council activities affecting the Mid-Atlantic. And I'm assuming, Peter, that we're going to go right to Jason, or did you have a few comments you wanted to make before we started? I do. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, Jason, Chris, and all those involved. Um, as liaison to the uh, uh, New England Council, it's my responsibility to identify issues that I think that are going to affect the Mid-Atlantic Councilor have some sort of uh, ancillary effect on the fisheries that are managed by this council. Um, and at the last council meeting, the New England Council meeting in June, um, there were a number of uh, issues that came up that I thought 
uh, should be brought before this council, not really for any uh, action at this time, but just so the council is aware that there are, um, the, the New England Council is working on some uh, fishery management plans that could possibly uh, impact some of the fishery management plans that uh, the Mid-Atlantic uh, manages. Um, so Jason, uh, I'd sent some emails to Chris and Jason, um, had some conversations with Jason. He put together a short presentation um, just to uh, inform this council on, on, on uh, some of the issues that may impact us. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jason. Thank you. Good morning, Jason. Morning, thank you. Um, I just wanna thank New England staff also helped me uh, kind of make sure I had most of this right. Um, so the four primary topics, we're gonna to chat about monkfish, winter flounder and longfin squid fishery, uh, sturgeon, and then the Great South Channel Habitat Management Area. Um, just a caveat, there's other stuff going on in New England that could affect the Mid-Atlantic as well, but just focusing on a few highlights uh, that Peter had um, wanted to flag. So first one, monkfish. Uh, New England's working on 23 to 25 specifications. Um, don't know yet if the monkfish assessment will lead to higher or lower ABCs, and that will, um, you know, may affect what management measures um, kind of are practicable or, and make sense. Um, I put assessment up there in quotes for a reason. It's a plan B smooth approach because there's not like a fully functional regular assessment for monkfish. So it's basically they just scale things with the trawl survey. Um, so pretty, pretty basic approach here. Um, and how that assessment works out is the trend is up or down. How New England's SSC reacts to that uh, is yet to be determined. Um, but depending on what comes out for the ABCs, uh, the committee and the PDT have been working on potential changes to trip limits, uh, days at sea measures and mesh size. Uh, there's been kind of a focus on discards, both are there some ways to reduce discards and also how to try to set aside an appropriate amount of discards uh, for monkfish? Uh, they've been kind of reviewing a bunch of different, um, you know, kind of averaging, medians, different ways to just even just kind of set aside uh, the right amount going forward. There's a good bit of variability in monkfish discards, so it's um, been a challenge to kind of get a precise discard set aside. So the current plan is for December actions by the councils. Um, there's, in general for frameworks, uh, the two councils have to concur. There are some provisions um, in the regs for certain circumstances where the councils don't concur uh, with monkfish. It's a little different than our regs for dogfish for similar circumstances. So I'm still trying to fully understand that. Um, so I may have some follow-up on that later. But uh, so um, August 30, there's an AP and committee meeting um, and it's a hybrid meeting. Uh, and that'll be kind of the next step as development of that action continues. Um, so I don't know if Peter may have some additional follow-up from his involvement um, in their council meetings, but uh, that's kind of the first item, thanks. Any questions for Jason or Peter? Okay, um, so I, oh, Peter. I was just going to flag <clears throat> for, for those who are listening and for those who are participating here in the public that the announcement has gone out that the uh, Monkfish Advisory Panel, they're looking for participants in that and um, that that information is readily available at the New England uh, uh, Fisheries Management Council website. And I encourage people to participate in that process it's because it's going to be a very important process going forward. We are going to be making some changes to that fisheries management plan. Um, and they're, they're, they're going to be pretty significant changes. And we need to do that as a joint action, which is why it's very important that we have uh, advisory panel participation uh, in those meetings. So. Thank you for my, my announcement there. Thanks. Thanks, Peter. Uh, Chairman Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, I mean, it's critical for the AP to get involved. 
But I, just to remind everybody, the monkfish, monkfish is split into two different stocks, the northern stock and the southern stock. And obviously, the southern stock is the one that should be most uh, concerning to this body. So thanks. And there's five members from the Mid-Atlantic Council on that monkfish committee. So thanks, Eric. OK, Jason, we'll go ahead and move on. Next item um, was that uh, New England has seen lower winter flounder catches. Um, so the percent of catch that is coming, and it's mostly discards, is coming from what Garfo analyzes as a quote unquote squid fishery has been higher and has been triggering um, looking at uh, New England, looking at a potential sub ACL or some kind of other management measures to try to control or reduce discards of winter flounder in um, this quote unquote squid fishery. Um, I'm pretty sure that that's not ilex. I've never seen any winter substantial winter flounder disc interactions in ilex. So I think it's a long fin squid fishery. Um, and based on some, some old analyses for a previous action, um, I hadn't seen too much in trimesters one or three. So I think it's probably the trimester two squid fishery, long fin squid fishery. So the PDT will be kind of further analyzing, um, you know, exactly where that bycatch is coming from. Um, and we got a letter from New England to kind of consult with them on establishing an AM for small mesh fisheries. Uh, the letter is fairly open-ended and not exactly clear about who, there was some discussion in New England. Should New England do the AM? Should the Mid-Atlantic do the AM? Um, I'm not sure it's quite clear in New England when they have some cross plan AMs like um, for scallops, Eric, was, is it window pane or yellow tail? Um, where there's, I think, some AMs in that plan, they integrate that, that committee and that AP to provide a lot of input. So I think they're trying to kind of replicate that to at least get some more input from the Mid Atlantic. Um, and, you know, uh, again, there's a, uh, committee and PDT meetings coming up, um, and you know, may just you know, this may be something where the mid requests. Um, I was trying to brainstorm about you know what what other um, kind of engagement would we request? I participate on the PDT. We have Mid Atlantic Council members on the committee, I and mean, maybe a joint AP meeting where we bring in our MS Macroscope Butterfish AP. To participate in that process was an idea I, I had just recently. Um, so again, it's this request from New England to consult with them, um, but it's not quite clear to me um, what form that may take, but may have some impact on the squid fishery uh, in in the future. Eric. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, there's a lot of things in play right now. Um, the status of the of the winter flounder stock is um, under review. Uh, we're going to get a peer. We'll get the peer re review at our meeting in September. So this the stock may change. So that may help this particular situation. And Jason is correct that that you know as, as far as it, are the discards coming from trimester two? Well, I, I, I couldn't say one way or another. I have a, my own opinion, but uh, it has been requested of the PDT to take a better look at what is the source of those discards. So with those two things in play, there is a possibility that, uh, I'm not gonna say the problem's gonna go away, but it may be less of a concern because the bycatch, uh, the listed bycatch is relatively high in a squid fishery, so. Peter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And in my email, um, uh, June 30th to Chris and Jason, I did note that uh, regional administrator did state something along the lines that the ground fish fishery should not be developing an AM for the small mass fishery if the small mass fishery are the only ones that it affects something to that. It's not a quote because 
it said it as I was trying to type it. And <laughs> I might have missed something there. So, so, um, so we should uh, we should engage in this if there is going to be something coming out of the ground fish. So, thank you. All right, thanks, Peter. Chris Moore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As um, the discussion was indicated, there's a lot of uncertainty. But I have I have a couple questions. If in fact um, we're looking at a sub ACL, that designation would occur when, Eric? In this August, or would that occur later in the year? I mean, when do, when would you guys identify that in fact you have a sub ACL that we have to worry about? Well, I I think uh, Dr. Moore that we have we have to have a better look at what what we're actually looking at, and does is a sub ACL even an option? Oh. Okay. To, to cure this problem that that's the first thing but uh at at the ground fish committee meeting which is on uh september 15th it is a topic for discussion um so maybe you'll get a little better clarity there but you got a lot of stuff up in the air right now chris thank thanks for that eric in terms of in terms when you see the words consult with the mid-atlantic council so we've been involved with sub ACLs and AMs before. It's a little fuzzy. I can't remember how many years ago, Jason. I think actually it was Julia that was involved, and that was with window pane. And we took significant lead on the development of something. I remember that we spent a lot of effort on it. And I'm wondering if we're talking about something similar for winter flounder. And if in fact we are, then we need to really think about what that's going to mean for our 2023 implementation plan. But again, I'm, it sounds like there's still a lot of things that have to have to play out. But I'm just trying, like Jason, to kind of think about how our how our future looks as it relates to this particular action. Jason, or but just in terms of timing, I think. They'd be trying to get in a sub ACL for May of next year, and then they evaluate the performance, and they'd want like an AM a AM for May one of twenty twenty four. So I I don't think it's like a super rush um, thing if it's that sub ACL and AM tied to that. Um, again, I think the main thing is to avoid an overall ACL overage. It may be worth exploring, you know, just some management measures to try to address winter flounder discards separate from and 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 a sub ACL. But again, I think these are all be discussions that will kind of be working through the process in the next months and year. Um, but again, since you know, depending on what the outcome is, there um, definitely could be some impact on on the squid fishery. Um, mostly, just wanted to flag it. Again, flag it for the council, flag it for uh, participants just to keep an eye on. Okay, thanks, Jason. Megan Lapp. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Megan Lapp, Seafreeze. Jason, I just have a question. Um, if the justification for this is to need to avoid ACL overages, they're only harvesting like 30% of the Southern New England ACL, like catches of winter flounder, Southern New England winter flounder have not even come close to the ACL over the past several years. So I'm kind of like, if you're only catching 30% of the ACL, why are you worried about an overage of the ACL is kind of my question. My general sense is that with um, some of the low catches of ground fish, there's just attention to little landings, um, you know, where other catches are occurring. And this is one spot in this other category uh, that's not directly controlled. Some folks in New England have been interested in having more direct control of that other category. Um, Chairman Reed may have more thoughts on this topic, but, um, and again, I think a lot of it may, the, the the new assessment and um, it may conclude may have a big change in stock status, but it's not going to change the overall downward direction of trend of the stock in the last you know 
20 years. So, um, so yeah, a lot of things in play, but in terms of the overall rationale, the plan says, you know, if catches in these other areas exceed 5% um, or some percent, that the council will start to think about AMs or sub ACLs. So that's, um, I think it's that there's plan contents, but in terms of the exact details um, of where this arose from, um, Chairman Reed might have some additional thoughts. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm thinking Amendment 16 of the ground fish plan. I think that's where it came from. Yeah, I think that is where the initial language in terms of, um, you know, potentially keeping an eye on these other um, sources of catch. Um, and then again, some of these analyses have showed, um, you know, a relative to overall catch, a substantial amount of catch coming from the squid fishery. So that kind of triggered the, the interest in New England. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Bonnie Brady. Hi, Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. I'm on the AP for Groundfish in New England, and what in the advisory panel, I think at past committee, was the idea of having a full review. Sarah, you and I have been talking about this since you started in the job, except it was window pane then. Um, I think there's something, and you can confirm if it's 5% over whatever the limit is, then for ground fish in general, or they started, they did an AM, they did it with window pane with other species. Part of the problem is that we're not even sure because they have all these lists of categories of landings versus catch, and there's an other category that basically is out there somewhere, and it's based on, from what I've been told from 10 years ago, they look at the BTR, they see what the catch is, and then they make an assumption as to whether or not it is from that fishery. Small mesh is anything smaller than five and a half inches, correct, I believe? Is that someone from Groundfish, I think, can help me on that for the decision making? So we're not sure where it is. It's also, if this is being caught in a federal fishery, I'm not quite sure. We haven't seen a lot of winter flounder at all in southern New England in recent times. So state has, I think, a bycatch of 50 pounds. But so it's a real question where it's coming from, if it is in fact that, if it's a trip on some boat that's been extrapolated, or if it is even winter flounder. And those are all questions that we need to know because feel confident our AM will be an area where we will not be allowed. I get the general feeling that we'll have something similar to a window pane type of event where we have a closed area, and that would be a great concern to the squid fishery. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Bonnie. James Fletcher. I would ask that before we go down this line, we look have the Habitat Committee look at the information from Jamaica Bay on the effects of endocrine disruptors on the winter flounder. It's not going to do any good if we don't get to the bottom. Now, I know that the council, if I want them to become deaf and dumb, all I have to do is mention endocrine disruptors. But before we go down this road, we need to look at the true problem of what's causing the decline of the fish. And it's sort of frustrating to go down a road of squid or whatever, and we do nothing to try to increase the catches. All we do is try to decrease using some other fish and the true cause of that fish is decline. Just look under the internet of endocrine disruptors in Jamaica Bay, and winter flounder comes up. But I'll be quiet. It's just frustrating that nobody is looking at where the true problem is. And I know that I'm beating against the charge in the windmill. Thank you. Appreciate your comment, James. All right, seeing no other hands around the table or in the audience or online, um, 
Let's go ahead and move on, Jason. Stephen, can you tap on the screen once? I'm not getting any uh, board. Oh, there we go. Thanks. Um, okay, Sturgeon. Sturgeon was discussed um, at a previous Mid Atlantic Council meeting. Um, the same kind of presentation, I think, from the service at New England generated, a, I think, a bit more discussion um, about what might be coming up for potential um, actions. Uh, Peter just thought it was important to kind of relay that, you know, there and, and reinforce that there likely will be kind of an, an action that the councils are required to take, um, what that means for relevant fisheries, monkfish, dogfish, um, et cetera. So um, New England, I think, was thinking about sending um, some comments on the draft action plan, um, but then there's that recent court case that kind of called into question the status of the biological opinion. Now that was due to right whale issues, but the court case was just like, um, you know, I think the, the, the language was like invalidation or something like that. So uh, I'm not quite sure if New England is going to do comments on that draft action plan, but the Mid Atlantic's um, intended approach after that last presentation was you know, see what NIMS comes up with for the final action plan. Um, we're expecting that, I think, in September. Um, and then the councils or NIMS uh, would have to do some action um, in 2023 to reduce sturgeon catch or bycatch. Um, the draft action plan wasn't very clear about how much catch would have to occur. I think NIMS is kind of chewing on that a bit. Um, there were some potential recommended measures in that draft action plan. Um, but anyway, that action plan final is pending. Um, it likely will trigger some action either by the councils or if the councils don't do something um, by NIMS looking for, NIMS was originally looking for a May 2024 deadline for implementation. Again, it's not clear exactly what that threshold of sufficient action and catch reduction might be. Um, so again, no real change here from what the council discussed last time, um, but I think uh, Peter just wanted to kind of reinforce as a, uh, another pending issue that's li likely to take up some, some time and attention in 2023. Okay, thanks, Jason. Eric Reed. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jason. Yeah, at our council meeting, we had a long discussion about sturgeon and the, the, the pending action, which we're not He's exactly right. We're not sure what it's going to say, but the, the service has asked us to provide comments and uh, New England's comments, which are fairly extensive, are still in in draft. Um, but I believe Dr. Moore has seen that draft. So, um, you know, I, I don't know how how you want to handle that, but um, my suggestion would be or, you know, when we know what we what we have to do, uh, in my opinion, it, in, in the interest of efficiency and and all that entails, is perhaps the two councils would work on some sort of omnibus action that would address whatever has to be done. I mean, obviously, monkfish and dogfish are jointly managed by the two councils, so I, I mean, that that's. That's my thought on that. But as far as the Mid Atlantic uh, commenting on this, I mean, maybe Ms. Bland can tell us whether or not they actually want those comments by Friday. But uh, like I said, Dr. Moore, uh, I believe, has a draft of our comments, and, and uh, you know, he's welcome to speak to what he's seen. So, So the deadline is Friday. Was that a request for a possible extension to give the councils additional time to coordinate comments for submission? No, I just I just wanted to make sure that that was in fact when you wanted them by. Um, and just as an aside, the full moon tomorrow is ironically the sturgeon moon. So, so you know, only you would know that, Eric. Um, let's go to Chris. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. So we did receive the presentation in June. Had a conversation at, the, at our meeting relative to the draft action plan. This council didn't have much to say. Fine. We had we had the presentation. We didn't get a lot of a lot of comments around the letter. It was just the opposite up in New England. In fact, there were extensive comments at the table. And I have seen the draft letter that uh, New England Council has put together. Um, and it has many of the things, in fact, all the things that I think this council would support. So we can talk about the draft. I don't know, Eric, it's, it's kind of sensitive because it's a draft letter. It hasn't been submitted yet. But there's things in there that, that basically support concerns that we've expressed before as it relates to start. And if the uh, New England Council is amenable to having us sign on to that letter, I think that would be you know, fine. Support everything that uh, they've said. So again, it's it, it's kind of sensitive because they haven't asked us to do that, and it's their letter. But um, again, it, it validates or it says everything that we would say. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Moore. Yeah, it, it, it is a draft, so it's not open for public display. Um, I thought it would, given that the comments are due by Friday, and today is uh, Wednesday, I thought it was important for, at least for you, um, to have an idea where New England was going with our comment letter. It, just to, I mean, we've got two co-managed co species, and this is gonna affect both of them, um, you know, wh whether or not this council will give you the latitude to endorse that letter, uh, I think you just have to, I think the procedure is you and Mr. Neese have to work out whether or not that's acceptable, which I would think that it would be. Um, but, you know, you don't have a lot of time. I mean, that, that it, it was kind of sprung out there at the, at the Riverhead meeting and, and, you know, it was hard to comment on something you really couldn't digest, I suppose, but uh, I, I just, it was a, I just wanted you to have it, but it is not a public document. Chris. So, thank you, Mr. Chair, I appreciate that, Eric, and I think, you know, what you, what you said, which is basically having, number one, this council comfortable with the fact that I would reach out to Tom and basically indicate our support for signing on to the letter, if that was an option. Folks are comfortable with that, and that's something I certainly can do. Obviously, we have a timing issue. Uh, this thing is due on Friday, and today is Wednesday. I could just, you know, give you a couple high-level, you know, issues that appear in the letter, but just to make you a little bit more comfortable. Uh, one of them is that the action plan should clarify the status of the biop. Uh, the action plan was written to fulfill a requirement of the biop. The court decision is not related to Atlantic sturgeon. This biological opinion was declared invalid. As a result, the status of the biops, reasonable and prudent measures related to Atlantic sturgeon is unclear. Uh, so again, this is something that we, you know, we've stated as well. Staff has had interactions with PR staff about that particular issue. Another high level issue that's mentioned in the letter is the interaction between the action plan and phase two measures of the Atlantic large whale take reduction team should be discussed. So remember, we have this interplay, sturgeon, whales, um, some of the gear modifications, potential closure areas included in the action plan are similar to those being considered for phase two gill net, uh, gill net fisheries by the um, large whale take reduction team. Um, and the council's understanding the implementation of phase two measures are anticipated for 2023. So how will the timing impact council action on sturgeon bycatch measures? Recommend a coordinated approach between these two efforts. Again, something that we, we've said before. Uh, it would be helpful if the development of management measures it will be help. It will help development of management measures if the action plan provides additional detail on data used in the plan. At a minimum, the action plan should describe how the councils can obtain the information used in its development. Again, something that we've said in support. So. Um, if folks are comfortable with me talking to Tom about potentially signing on to this letter, I'll do that. 
If there's anybody that objects to that, certainly let me know. Okay, thanks, Chris. Eric, I, I just want to be clear that the draft letter developed with all the comments that were made at our council meeting. I don't want anybody to think this isn't a, you know, top secret, uh, non transparent, uh, you know, don't be foying me, my cell phone, wanting to know what I'm thinking about what I'm having for breakfast. But, uh, it, it, you know, it's, we had a, we had a lengthy discussion. Uh, Mr. Hughes was there. He can certainly, if Chris missed anything, he can certainly add to it. But our, our letter was based on the conversation we had uh, at our council meeting. And that, that's where those comments were all initially developed. Yeah, thanks for that. Eric, let me ask Peter. He's, Peter, you have your hand up. Do you have any additional thoughts? No, I, and I fully support your, uh, this council signing on to that. But it is um, maybe a little bit of a disadvantage to both councils that it's not a final, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, these are preliminary recommendations that have been um, given to us and with everything that Chris just stated with large whales and the take reduction team. And it's very, it's a very cloudy issue. And this comment period closes on Friday. And I don't necessarily that that's really fair to the council's uh, vote who really, you know, there was a very lengthy discussion, almost a two, two and a half hour discussion up in New England about this. Um, and there was very limited discussion here at the Mid Atlantic, and it really became aware to me that this is a much larger issue, and maybe this council really had the opportunity to really think about um, because it was, I think, I think it was the first presentation that had been given to us. And here's a presentation. Um, comment on it. You know, we don't know what the final rule is. Uh, so, so it's very hard to anticipate what that final rule is going to be and comment on something that you don't know, you, you don't know about. Um, so when, you know, Sarah asked, and maybe, and maybe you're supposed to, and Sarah, I would ask you this, is this comment period and then when a final rule, and I said the word final earlier is very ominous, um, when the final rule is published, is there going to be a comment period then also? That would be, you know, then we'll, we'll maybe because based on the comments that we've heard on the final rule, maybe we have to open that rule back up or are we closing the books on it and that's the rule and um, and that's the end of it. So so we don't really have we don't know what's coming at us, but yet we're asked to comment on it. And so it's, it's very hard to come up with, uh, you know, very, very intelligent comments to address something that we don't know. So. I don't know if I made any sense. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, that certainly made sense, Peter. I'll ask uh, Sarah Bland if she has any comments for, from Garpo's perspective. Go ahead, Sarah. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so a couple things to clarify. Um, first, I think all of the presentations and conversations that have happened at the council and the commission um, have been extremely valuable. Um, you know, I, as you can imagine, this came out of the biological opinion um, in 2021. And so even on our end, there was a pretty short turnaround for us to try to compile as many experts, technical experts from states and as well as within the agency to brainstorm the issue of what information is available um, on sturgeon and sturgeon bycatch, um, what information might we need um, and what potential management measures could we be thinking about? So the action plan was intended to be iterative. Um, the draft action plan was meant to give people something to respond to in terms of brainstorming ideas and potential measures and things that we could be looking at collectively. Um, it's not meant to be overly prescriptive that this is what will be included in any future rulemaking, but more a series of ideas that we can build off of as we go. Um, so we definitely intended the action plan to be iterative and kind of like a, a brainstorming to give us a jumping off point to then have the discussion of specific management measures. There could be things not in the action plan right now that people raise or that people provide in comments. Um, our, our intent is to take all of the comments and discussion that have happened, um, all of the written comments that come in as well, and incorporate them into the action plan 
and then produce sort of a, an, a new or updated version of the action plan in September. And that timeline is largely based on the parameters and the requirements that were put in place in the biological opinion in terms of you know, how fast and when we need to complete these various steps. So we outlined, you know, kind of backing up the timeline of when measures would need to be in place, we outlined a timeline that we would release that updated action plan in September, which is why when we have presented this to the council, we've asked for comments on the action plan by mid-August, which is kind of that Friday deadline that Eric referred to initially. Um, I would say I think, um, you know, we've tried to address things preemptively so that there are no bombshells or anything like that or, you know, huge significant comments that would really change kind of what we're thinking about or looking at in the action plan. So we think if comments come in from the Mid-Atlantic and New England Council, let's say next week as opposed to this Friday, I think that's totally workable. And if that gives you know the executive directors a little bit more time to coordinate on the letter, see if there's any additions that you know anybody wants to make to the letter, um, that's totally fine. Um, and I'll just clarify, um, Peter, on your last point, you know, this action plan is not meant to be prescriptive in what must be included in a future rulemaking. So there could be additional measures that come up um, or that are considered by the councils or the agency um, in a future rulemaking. But this is not rulemaking. This is intended to kind of outline a framework for the steps that we will work through to consider what management measures need to be put in place to reduce sturgeon bycatch, if that helps. So ultimately, this action plan is kind of the beginning of the process. Ultimately, in the process, there will be a rulemaking to consider any of the management measures that are proposed. Okay, thank you, Sarah, for that clarification. Uh, let me go to the public. Um, Greg DiDomenico, I saw your hand. Go ahead, Greg. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm, I'm really only asking for possible clarification from the executive director and from Garfo. Quite frankly, it's real hard to hear back here. So I just want to make sure this is a topic um, we've been working on in New, York, New Jersey for about 14 years or more. Do we still have time for the Mid-Atlantic um, Protected Resource AP to put forth alternatives, gear modifications, call them what you want to, do we still have time to do that and have input through the council to provide those alternatives? So let me ask Carson maybe to come up to the table. Go ahead, Carson. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so we don't have a specific protected resources AP for the Mid-Atlantic Council, um, but we can meet, uh, convene the APs for the impacted fisheries. Um, but we have a protected resources committee, and the protected resources committee um, can address uh, the sturgeon issue. We're already planning to meet in September on the uh, large whale take reduction plan issues. Um, the September timing probably wouldn't match with reviewing the uh, released final action plan, but I think that um, as the council discusses what uh, their act, how they want to respond to that action plan, um, we can try to get some AP feedback at that point, potentially. Jason? T timing wise, my thinking was that if the councils initiate a framework or joint amendment to say spine and dogfish and monkfish, that's going to be a couple of meetings, probably dealing with final action in the second half of 2023. So, yeah, I mean, I think there's some time to get some input from participants one way or another. Sarah. Thank you. I just, um, to Greg's comment, um, I wanted to reiterate again that the action plan is intended to be a framework to guide us, um, and it was also intended to provide a review of all of the available information. It is not a requirement that whatever we ultimately pursue as measures must be included in the action plan now. So it's very possible we have an action plan, and as we get additional 
feedback, input, ideas from the various committees and experts that we could come up with, you know, measures or recommendations that aren't necessarily in the action plan or, you know, are an extension of what's included in the action plan. But there's no requirement that everything has to be in the action plan for it to be considered in any future rulemaking. Um, so it's, it's not intended to be overly prescriptive um, in terms of what's available to um, consider for management measures. Thank you all. Okay, thanks for that, um, that question, Greg. It sounds like we have some things in the works uh, to address your, your comment. Okay, so before we move on, let me just look around the table see if uh, there's any objection to uh, having Chris work with Tom regarding the draft uh, document from New England. Is there any objection on Chris working with Tom? Seeing none, yes, Chris, you've got a couple days to uh, talk to Tom and, and see what happens from there. So uh, I appreciate the update uh, on Sturgeon, and I think uh, I think Jason has one more. I think there's one more issue that wants to, we want to discuss. So I'm going to go back to Jason on that. Go ahead, Jason. Sure. Uh, this is just that um, so there's a, um, a, a final report for this exempted fishing permit project um, related. You know, really, I think folks are familiar with it, probably more familiar than me. Um, this Nantucket Shoal and Surf Glen Motion Quag issue. Um, the main thing um, kind of wanted to flag is that report on that project is out um, and New England's Habitat Committee is going to be meeting um, on August 18th to further discuss. Um, it's a hybrid access meeting. It's in Wakefield, Mass, and there's webinar information on New England site. Um, and that's all. the only really information I had on this, just flagging that, that um, this issue, which I think has been discussed at the council before, is, is still churning um, with some, some meetings coming up. Okay, thanks, Jason. Any questions or comments for Jason? Okay, and just for um, information to the council, so Peter Hughes and I both plan to be present at the meeting next week in, uh, in Wakefield, so uh, we'll be able to come back to the council with information that, we're, that you know, we discussed there. I do have somebody online with a question. Let's see. Bonnie Rome. Yeah, hi there. Uh, <clears throat> just curious about where we can find this uh, report, this analysis of the, uh, the research that's been done. Where would we go to find that? Eric? The PDT had a, had a look at the uh, discussion about the report, and you can see it in there. Uh, their meeting materials for their last meeting and the meeting materials for the meeting coming up uh, next week uh, should be available uh, tomorrow. I believe it's tomorrow. You can find it there, Mike. Okay, thank you, Eric. Okay, thank you for that. Anything, anyone else in the audience, around the table, online, on the phone? on a typewriter somewhere. Uh, anybody else have anything to offer before we break? All right, seeing none. Peter, thank you uh, for making this a highlight uh, to have this discussion. Chris and I were just saying that this is something that we might wanna put in the hopper uh, on a continued basis, just to be make sure we stay aware of issues and, and work that's being done in the Mid-Atlantic or in the New England that affects the Mid-Atlantic. So. Thanks for that, and thanks, Jason, for your presentation. We're going to go ahead and break for lunch. It's now 1230, and we are expected back at 130 for Butterfish Specs. So got an hour for lunch. We'll see you all back here at 130. Thank you. <laughs>